Call this meeting of the Perryton Independent School District order. Let the record show that a quorum of board mem members are present. This meeting has been duly called. Notice this meeting has been posted in accordance with Texas Open Meeting Act, Texas Government Code, Chapter 551. Would you all pray with me? Dear Heavenly Father, we're so grateful for the opportunity to meet today. We're grateful for the, the graces that you have shown us, the gifts that you have laid upon us. We ask that you be with us today as we discuss the future of the district, that all of our decisions we make are in your will for us. In thy heavenly name we pray. Amen. Amen. Do we have anyone for open forum? No open forum. Next item on the agenda, presentation by Long Range Planning Committee. I read the whole sentence. On possible bond election to renovate Wright Elementary and Perryton High School, including concession stand and dressing rooms. So, our presentation is by a group. Yes. I will hand the meeting to y'all. Would you prefer that any questions we may have be directed during the presentation or at the end? Probably at the end. At the end? Yes. Make it happen. All right. Uh, thank you for meeting us here today. I know you guys have been anticipating this meeting for us coming in and telling you how to spend money. But we do appreciate you guys coming in today. Um, for our agenda today, uh, we'll have a committee overview, uh, state of the district facilities and historical information, and uh, some recommendations to the school board. After my presentation uh, from the Long Range Committee, I'll bring up John Blackburn uh, to go over any of the tax implications of our proposal and any questions you guys might have. Uh, the committee overview. Uh, some of the committee chair uh, co-chairs are myself, Shay Cunningham, Cynthia Simons, Shirley Howard, Gus Hernandez, uh, John Blackburn, our financial advisor, Steve Butler, architect, and Greg Huseman uh, for the builders. Our committee purpose was to evaluate current and future facility needs and develop a comprehensive plan to address outdated facilities to support quality educational programs. The committee is providing uh, financial, I mean, sorry, facility and transportation recommendations to the Perryton Independent School Board of Trustees after a thorough assessment and analysis of relevant data. District staff members and district consultants were present to assist the committee and to serve as information providers. As I stated, the committee uh, was represented diverse perspectives of our community which is invaluable plan to the facilities and transportation needs. As I stated, the co-chairs were myself, Shirley Howard, Cynthia Simons, and Gus Hernandez. Uh, for the committee members, all participants were residents of Perryton Independent School District. The committee included parents, non-parents, campus staff, students, community members, business owners, and grandparents to provide a mix of background and geographic representation across the school district. The next sheet, next slide, you'll get to see uh, kind of a complete list of our committee members. There's around uh, around 40 members total. Um, and as I stated, many were PISD staff uh, and definitely a broad range of Perryton taxpaying citizens uh, were represented on this board. Uh, some criteria for our recommendations today. Uh, was to consider the educational needs of all the students, uh, align recommendations with the district's mission, vision, and goals, meet the educational requirements of the district while supporting and aligning facility and transportation needs. Also identify and prioritize facility needs, consider the district's current financial position, and remain fiscally conservative. Also provide recommended solution to address aging facilities and evolving educational needs. As you can see on the next slide, uh, this is kind of uh, some meeting dates of our committee. As you can see, we started this about a year ago, uh, March of 22. At each meeting, we toured a different facility with the help of admin, teachers, and students at that facility uh, at each location, providing us with valuable information regarding the needs of each of your facilities. The decision-making process uh, kind of boils down to three points, three bullet points here. Uh, as a committee, what can we support? As a community, what can we support? And as a taxpayer, what do we think is reasonable? The next few slides, we're gonna go over the state of the district's facilities 
and any historical information regarding bonds or improvements to those facilities. <coughs> On the first slide, as you can see, Harrington Kinder, built in 1956, uh, a couple late 90s additions, a couple classrooms were added. 2015, uh, new main water line and new supply lines. And in 21, uh, kind of a remodel of your uh, portable full day pre-K. Right now, we'll skip right, let's go down to Williams. Williams is the newest campus uh, in your district, built in 1999. Uh, as recently as 21, showers were added to the nurse's office, and just the last year, science labs were added. And we poured all that, and the, that facility looks, looks great for the age of that facility. Now, if you go back up to right, it's kind of the bullet point for this slide here, is right elementary. Um, right was built in 1960. Uh, in the late 90s, you added a cafeteria and dining area was remodeled. But as the current facility was built in 1960, there's been no structural enhancements to that facility since 1960. We toured Wright Elementary. I'll hit some of the key bulletin points of uh, the current needs and concerns at Wright, according to your staff and your admin there. A big problem that the, all the teachers brought up to us was the playground, for example. The playground has become a hazard for students. The blacktop is uneven, creating a dangerous situation for students. And from what they tell us, daily trips to the nurse's station for cuts, bruises, and scrapes. Um, a big issue at Wright Elementary also is the electrical wiring system. It's extremely outdated. Um, from what we've been told, a shelf life for a wiring system is 40 years. You're looking at 63 right now at Wright Elementary. Um, with that is causing many fire concerns. There's a lack of outlets to charge the tech stations. When I say tech stations, we're meaning iPad stations, uh, Chromebooks, etc. Um, some rooms with only one to two outlets per room, uh, with teachers having to use many power strips uh, just to power the classroom, basically, which is definitely a fire hazard there. Um, also, along with the electrical wiring system, is the clay-based sewer lines. Those are extremely outdated as well in a constant battle for maintenance staff. Uh, there are flooding issues out front of out front of right by the pickup and drop off lines. On there daily, I can attest to that. There's constant water there. Uh, when did it rain last? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Y'all do good at water ice. <laughs> <laughs> um, another big issue at right, obviously, is the restrooms. The restrooms are outdated throughout the school. Taps are constantly running. Uh, you have restrooms with no stalls, and the general lack of restrooms for the current number of staff and students there is a concern for most of the admin and teachers there. Um, another big issue is lack of storage for staff in their rooms, which is creating a lack of room for instruction. So what they're doing instead of where the instruction room's at, they're creating, they're taking up some of that instruction room for their storage currently. So that's an issue that the teachers brought up also. Uh, the windows in the classrooms are single pane outdated windows causing climate control issues for students. So in your weather extremes, early fall, too hot, right now too cold. So example, last week, when it, or this, sorry, this week, earlier this week, when it was cold, all students were wearing coats during instruction, walking down the hall or in the cafeteria. Constantly, you know, concerns with the extreme climate control issues from single pane windows there. So those are some of the uh, right elementary bullet points. We're going to move on. We'll go to the junior high. We toured the junior high, obviously. We had all of our, we had most of our meetings at the junior high. Um, so the junior high was built in 21, but that was the original high school. Uh, NX with the cafeteria in 56. Then obviously the last bond you guys passed was 2012 to re-renovate re, uh, the junior high. And every single board member, our committee member, sorry, that was there, we all toured it. Everybody was very impressed with the uh, remodel of the junior high. These gentlemen back here that are sitting here are the ones that were in charge of that. And uh, that, was a, that was a good remodel and everybody was very happy with that campus as of now. For the next campus, we'll go to the high school. Uh, the high school, very similar to Wright Elementary, built in 1960. And the same thing at the high school as we're talking about at Wright. There's been no structural enhancements to the original structure built in 1960. Everything that you see on the remodel side is additions. Addition with vocational building, uh, the uh, Rangerette. Science Wing was added in 99 and another portable building in 2010. 
So all of these are just additions on, but nothing to the current structure that was built 63 years ago. Um, so just like right, like we were talking about, built in 1960, uh, no remodel to the existing structure. Similar to right, it's the exact same thing. The wiring system is outdated, as well as the clay sewer lines. Most wiring systems, as we stated, are good for 40 years, and right now you guys are at 63 in two of your oldest buildings on your campuses. Um, the high school as well has single pane windows, creating climate control issues for both students and staff. Another big issue pressing at the high school include the lack of adequate dressing room space for athletic programs. When I went to school there 20 years ago, there wasn't as many programs to offer there is now. The amount of programs you guys offer now, there's not enough adequate space for dressing rooms. What I had a good example, Coach Fletcher told me the other day, so on a Tuesday or a Friday night in January, when you have a home basketball game, and you have a home soccer game, there's not enough dressing rooms for either one of those two uh, programs to take place at the same time, right now. So um, they're on the bus. Yeah, they're changing, they're changing on the bus or changing the somewhere. There's not enough dressing rooms for the current you know, programs you guys offer. Um, you know, another, another lack, uh, uh, another issue is a lack of appropriate number of coaching offices at the, at the high school. I know they're all crammed together in a couple offices and the same thing as the admin offices. There's not enough admin offices. There's not enough space for a waiting room for students to see admin. And I know the nurse's station can only see one student at a time. They can't even line up for you go to the nurse's station. Um, another big issue that I know everybody in here can probably agree on is the concession stand in the public restroom situation at Ranger Field. It's an embarrassing situation that's been going on for far too long. Um, and I think that's an issue that everybody in here will probably agree on. Okay, so those are some of the bullet points of the high school. We're going to move on to the Ludy Martin. Ludy Martin was built in 1970, but that was the original, just the bowling alley. You guys purchased that uh, facility in 2000 and uh, remodeled that for the alternative school. We did tour that facility. There may be a few issues here and there, but overall, it's a good facility. The next slide, we'll go over some of the previous bond history. I believe the 19, <coughs> I believe the 97 bond for 7.9 was for um, Williams, I believe. Um, I do know the 11 and 12 bond, uh, close to 19 million, was for your junior high. So your last bond passed was 11 years ago for facility upgrades. All right, now we'll get to the fun part. The recommendations from our planning committee. Recommendations upon completion of the facilities planning committee's evaluation and analysis, the committee reached consensus for the following recommendation. A May 2023 bond election totaling $39.5 million structured in three propositions as determined by election law to address the following priorities. Three or two, Jay? I'm sorry? Two or three, I've heard one says It's two. three. Three propositions now. We'll, we'll talk about that on the next yeah. one. Oh, yeah. So yeah, we'll yeah, do that's the proposition. It comes back later. Yeah, yeah. 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 Uh, for your first proposition, Proposition A will be $34.1 million. Um, that will be a Perryton High School renovation, Wright Elementary renovation, and a transportation. I'll go into those a little bit. So, as a committee, what we unanimously agreed on very early on is we don't want a new build. We don't think that's a good recommendation for a new build of a high school or a ride. As taxpayers and as board members, you don't want to leave empty facilities anywhere, right? And we are very pleased with the junior high renovation, so that's where we came with this, to go with just a renovation of the high school and Wright Elementary. The transportation part of this is about a half a million dollar part of this bond. From what we are being told, the facility buses have been breaking down lately and having issues with facility, facility buses, activity buses. Um, so this would be the purchase of two activity buses, 500,000, probably not new, obviously, but you know, the remote area we live in and the amount of programs that you guys offer, we're not driving 30 minutes half the time to get to where we're going and coming back from. So we believe this is a good, um, good asset to this proposition here. Proposition B, totaling $1.89 million, is an improvement and equipment of stadium facilities, including new concession, weight room, varsity JV dressing rooms, coaches' offices, and ranger fan slash guest restrooms. The improvements in Prop B will address the issues at Ranger Field as well as dressing room, weight rooms, and coaches' offices 
for all the, di the district's athletic programs. Proposition C will be a $3.51 million district multi-purpose facility. The committee believes this facility will be a valuable addition used district-wide. All athletic programs can use it, band, choir, any district meeting or function can be able, will be able to be utilized by this building. And these multi-purpose buildings have been something that's kind of started to pop up around the area. I know Groover's in the current construction of it. I believe Border did one with their renovation at their uh, football field, concession stand, that sort of thing. Uh, but this was just a facility that we believe in the climate and area that we live that would be, uh, be utilized by the entire district as a whole. So benefits of the proposed bond projects is obviously your ESSER funds, your COVID relief funds will be able to be used in this. Uh, use of the buildings for sure. Renovation to aging and outdated educational buildings. Addressing electrical fire hazards in all your buildings. And we, like we discussed, the purchases of reliable travel buses for students. Uh, so going in a little bit more on some of this, you know, we, we as a committee, we, we uh, We've been meeting for over almost a year on this. Uh, we are conscious of the current local and national economy and the economic pressures that are associated with both right now. Um, we don't take these recommendations lightly at all. Um, renovating the high school and riot will bring all the PISD buildings up to scale, we believe. Um, and it'll put the district as a whole in great shape in regards to all its campuses. Uh, you know, we're all taxpaying citizens in here. Nobody lacks their taxes raised by any means, but we feel that these facilities probably should have been upgraded years ago, and this is kind of the situation we're in right now. Um, we can all agree that there's never a good time to raise a bond. You're always going to say it's not a good time. You know, it's not a good time for now, or you can slide it five years down the road, and you'll find an extenuating circumstance, and you're going to say then it's not a good time to raise a bond. Um, but the fact of the matter is with this, right now at 39.5 million dollars is as cheap as you're ever going to get it you slide it down five or ten years and then you're for your hands forced and you have to do something you're probably looking at 45 or 50 million dollars for the exact same renovations that we're talking about right now um you know and another big point that we think is great for the school district also is your retention of your current staff and hiring of your new staff you know we understand that local districts you're competing with new hires you're competing with your own staff we, we i mean i know there's current staff now that you have that has left and gone to work at another local i mean sorry another surrounding communities district and they're still living here and they're driving back and forth if we can renovate these buildings get them up to standard you know this can help with you guys retaining your staff and bringing in new staff you hire you're going to try to hire a new right teacher for second grade you get to take her to a new brand new uh, classroom coach Hab's trying to bring in a new coach he gets to show them a new locker room weight room uh, coach's office just to help with the student athlete experience um, but like I said we we don't take these recommendations lightly um, and we feel that this is what's in best interest of not only the school district the staff uh, the community as a whole uh, but more importantly the students we feel like this is the best situation for all the students um, that's all I have for my recommendation from the committee but I'd like to bring up Mr. Blackburn who will discuss some of the tax implications of our proposals with you guys and then after he's done, if you guys have any questions, we got some architects, builders, ourselves, committee members, we can try to answer any questions you guys might have. Thank you for your time. Seems like a good spot to stay in, so I'm gonna stay in here too. On that mic there so I can oh, hear right you. Here. There okay. you go. There we go. Um, my name is John Blackburn. I'm with Live Oak Public Finance. I see lots of familiar faces. Some of you may uh, remember me from some of our discussions last year about uh, refinancing some of the district's bonds, which interest rates are back in a place where we're, we're kind of looking at that again. Um, I have been involved with your planning committee and, and um, James and all of your administrators as far as um, getting prepared for this recommendation to you and, and what the financial impacts might be. Um, it was mentioned that um, you know, everybody can always find a time that's not the greatest time to have a bond. Um, I, I do have some things to show you that I think this this timing that we're in right now is probably a good time to consider a bond. And the farther away that we get from 2022, um, the timing becomes less opportune. So we'll, we'll look at some of that as well. But um, definitely wanted to talk to you about the financial impacts of what was just discussed um, and a little bit about the propositions, how we arrived at, at three propositions instead of two, instead of one. Um, and where all that came from. So 
um, as I go through this. If you do have questions, please do feel free to stop and, and ask me, um, and, and then we can have some at the end as well. So um, just, just fire away. Um, just a, a little review of MNO and INS. You guys fully understand what your two tax rates are. Uh, I think the, the what's brought us here today is that your MNO represents everything that you need to run this district. For most districts, that's somewhere between 75 and 85 percent salaries. Whatever is left is what you have to operate your district on. Your MNO tax rate is subject to recapture for you guys since you're property wealthy. It's subject to the state funding formula. It's subject to everything. Um, the, the equalization of wealth formula, all of the things that the state puts on the MNO tax rate. Um, we're currently also experiencing um, tax rate compression again from, from the state legislature. So your MNO tax rate has been lowered for you. Um, the state has been putting some money back into the base funding formula, but um, the MNO tax rate and the collections that come from MNO are largely spoken for by most school districts, and if not, they're they're widely needed. Um, there was an old way of, of addressing facilities when, when you could charge a higher MNO tax rate and, and there wasn't as much that was reliant on the MNO tax rate where you could store away some MNO money and then potentially address your facilities with it. I would say that that way of addressing facilities has gone by the wayside with all of the things that we mentioned, recapture, compression, those types of things. So you just don't have enough MNO money left at the end of the day to address your most expensive item, which is facilities, um, which brings us to our bond side. Um, so your INS money that you collect under the INS tax rate is not subject to any of the state funding formulas. It's not subject to Robin Hood or recapture. It's not subject to compression. Um, the only thing that the INS tax rate is subject to is voter approval and how you guys choose to use that. The only thing that the INS tax rate goes towards is principal and interest on bond payments and those bonds are largely determined um, what the scope of those bonds are between committees like you just heard from and in this boardroom and then if bonds pass and are sold then, then you get things like you did at your junior high when, when you did the bond then. So um, INS is largely protected. Every dollar of INS stays here in the district and goes directly towards debt service. So none of those dollars leave here. 100 over $100 stay here and, and go towards what you decide under the purpose of your bond. So. Um, with it not being subject to recapture and you guys being property wealthy up from a technical standpoint, INS tax rate and INS dollars is the most efficient way for you to address facilities. There, there's not a better way for you to go after expensive projects like facilities than to take advantage of your INS rate. So that's definitely the most advantageous way to do what you're, what you're thinking about doing. As evident by the fact that, that you enacted some of that stuff to do the junior high renovation as well. So expensive, expensive stuff to address, and your best way to do it is with, with your bond rate. Um, we have narrowed it down to just a couple of, actually one project option, but I wanted to show it just two different ways and kind of have some discussion about that. Um, so Perryton ISD may be able to use INS pennies to, to fund new, new facilities projects, new infrastructure projects. Um, currently the district's INS tax rate is set at nine cents. I believe that's actually fluctuated a little bit back and forth over the last few years, and then we'll take a look at that. But that is two pennies less than it was last year. So you were at 11 cents last year, nine cents this year. I think is like three or four years ago, you were at eight cents, eight and a half cents. So it, it has moved around quite a bit. But um, let's see. Uh, the district's also re uh, it recently experienced compression on the M and O tax rate. So because your assessed value has increased specifically from last year, this year, but a little bit over the last few years. Um, you have been compressed on your M&O tax rate, and we'll talk a little bit about the effects of that. So, um, so the, <coughs> the two scenarios that we're looking at, both are based around the $39.5 million that was recommended by the Facilities Committee. I just ran it two different ways. I ran one on a 30-year term and one on a 25-year term, and I have tax impacts based around both, and we'll talk a little bit about that. Um, so if you run, if you run 39 and a half on, on a 30-year term, you're looking at about a 20 cent. INS tax impact. If you look at it on a 25 year term, you're looking at about a 22 cent tax impact. Um, both the same project amount, same delivery, just a little bit shorter term and a little bit less interest over the life. So we'll, we'll talk about both of those. Um, <clears throat> this slide is kind of a look at your tax rate history. Um, and and I, you, you may actually have some slides in front of you in print. I definitely have updated the ones on the screen. I was actually working on it last night at Childress, so they may be a little bit different. Um, but 
what we're seeing here is, is a history of your assessed value, your M and O rate, your INS rate, and your total tax rate, and I think that's um, important comparatively. So, over on the left is a, a few words just to kind of say what's what's highlighted there in bold. From just 21 to 22, the district has reduced the overall tax rate by 12.88 cents. That's two pennies of INS and 10.88 pennies of M and O compression. The two pennies you reduced because your value went up on the INS side, right? And your value's gone down. So you, you've had some fluctuation on the INS side. The 10.88 pennies of M&O, you didn't really get a choice in. <laughs> the state did that for you. So when we talk about an overall tax rate, you can see that from last year to this year, over on the far right, total tax rate, $1.734 to $94.46. 10.88 of that, you didn't really get a choice in. That was just reduced off your tax rate. Um, it may not have meant a huge net decrease in your m and funding, um, but it did reduce your tax rate quite a bit. Um, there would be an opportunity for you to enact those pennies on your INS side for bonds um, and take advantage of some pennies that you really didn't get the chance to, to decide whether they were going to be lost or, or kept. In addition to compression, that last bullet point down at the bottom of the left just says, in addition to compression, the state mandated homestead exemption was increased from $25,000 to $40,000 in, in May of 2022. That passed. So when we were talking about the timing of a bond and why we might consider one right now, this is one of those things that kind of lends to that timing. This is, a, this is a point in time where people are now getting to reduce their taxable home value by $40,000 instead of $25,000. So. There are some inherent savings that people have had recently in taxes that may make us consider um, the timing that we have and, and where a bond is. Couple that with the fact that your overall tax rate is as low as it's been in a long, long time. Um, that that kind of puts us in a position to at least consider um, what we're looking at from a tax impact standpoint, where that might leave us. Um, so there are some some looks there. I would say right now you're you're 1.22 billion in, in overall value. Um, it's, it's certainly not the highest that you've been in 2015, which would have been kind of the height, 14 and 15, the height of the oil field boom, you were up around 2 billion. Um, even with the kind of the crash of 16 and 17, you were still at 1.3 billion. So I think where you are in current assessed value, um, I'm gonna say the middle, a comfortable middle range of, of value. Um, there's a chance that it could fluctuate, but that very top line, I went ahead and just kind of projected what 2023 and 24's tax rate setting would look like if you were to have a successful bond election and you were assuming the highest tax increase of 22 cents. So um, nothing changed. Your assessed value is the same. Your M&O rate is the same. Your INS rate did increase by 22 cents, which we said would put you at about a dollar sixteen forty-six, somewhere in that range. And Again, I, I only use that, and, I, and I'll make the brief comparison we'll talk about it a little bit later on, is if you look at that row that says 2018, in 2018 you were at $1.1250, and you were at a higher assessed value amount. Today you're at about $1.22 billion, and if you, were, if you were to kind of maintain that value next year and have a successful election, you'd be at that $1.1646. So if we look at it from that standpoint, roughly four cents higher than where you were in 2018. Um, so from a comparative standpoint to where we've been in the past, where have we come from, where are we going, what are we getting for where are we going, um, within about four to five to six cents of where you were in 2018, you would have the full breadth of the renovation project to the high school, Wright Elementary, the improvements at the stadium, and potentially the multi-purpose facility. So um, pretty, um, a pretty nice comparison to see from a tax rate standpoint. I would say that probably some of the major drivers in that assessed value column weren't necessarily homesteads either. Although those values did go up and down, people do probably have a little bit higher homestead value than what they did before. Um, I would say that those probably weren't the major swings in value in the community, meaning we didn't have our homesteads just fly up and increase to create some of those value increases. It, it was born more by 313s and oil and gas and some of the other um, industrial type value that you have in Perryton. So, any questions on tax rate comparisons from where you were? Okay, we'll, we'll kind of revisit that a little bit in one of the later slides. So, if there are any questions, you can definitely ask. So. Okay, so what I wanted to show, because we talked about compression and the increase in, in the homestead exemption, is what did that do? What was the net, net effect of that? As we said, that passed in May of 2022, so this is the first tax collection cycle that that's been uh, in full 
full swing. So in 2021, you can see over there, um, I've got columns for everything, um, uh, market value of the home, the state mandated exemption, the taxable value of a home, your total tax rate, and then your annual and monthly tax dollars in total. So that's M&O and INS. It's showing if, if you had this value of home, what, what did you pay in taxes? Um, and so what you can see there on the left, that's in 2021. This is what, what your tax bill would have looked like in 2021. Your average home value here in the community is 106,000. So what we'll probably do is just look at that line there in the middle for 100,000 there in white. I mean, I think that gives you an idea of what your average home value or your, your average taxpayer would be experiencing. So in 2021, $25,000 homestead exemption would have been about 75,000 in taxable value. You have a dollar seven thirty four that is applied to that for an annual tax bill to the school of about 800 bucks, $805 monthly basis about $67 a month. So that's M&O and INS. Okay. If we switch over to the right, that same $100,000 home, you can see that the uh, mandated homestead exemption column has increased to 40,000. So a net taxable value of $60,000. So that right there created um, $15,000 worth of net taxable value savings on the home. Um, in addition to that, in the compressed rate column, you can see the 9446. So your total tax rate in 2021 through compression and the two pennies dropped off the INS dropped significantly. So a lesser taxable home value and a lesser tax rate applied to that obviously creates some substantial savings. You'll see on the $100,000 home about $566 a year in taxes. Um, for a total of about 240 bucks, $238 in total savings. Um, to your average home home value, and that, that's a pretty substantial amount of savings. That's wonderful. That's a wonderful thing to have happen. So um, when you look at, at tax rate compression um, and also the increase in, in the homestead exemption, it led to savings in the community, and, and there's a range of those savings that are listed there. So just know going into this, from 2021 to 2022, you are looking at a pretty decent amount, palatable amount of savings in tax dollars um, to your to your average taxpayers here. If your home value did not increase. Uh, that's correct. That's correct. So um, if your home value did increase, it would be a detractor to this. Mm -hmm. um, yep. And because that did Most happen, we're did. actually not comparing apples to apples on this screen. Yeah. The home in one right. is not the home in the second one. In the second We year. all saw that. Yeah. Certainly. So I would say that on a on a home by home basis, I can't show an, I can't show the increase on a home by home basis, right? No. But I guess what this is showing is that for a hundred thousand dollars or sixty thousand of taxable value, yes. you then that's what your payment is. And yes. if you have a hundred and twenty thousand dollars of taxable, so you, you can easily multiply. So Yeah, this is the I school side of it. The the appraisal district has their own side and they meet in the middle and that's what you're actually Certainly, but and I, I think I'm just trying to represent based on taxable value what you might have experienced in savings, but it's really tough for me to represent yeah, each person's individual taxable value. But yes, but I just wanted to. I agree. That I point, agree, and that's that's happened statewide as, as appraisal yes. districts have increased, and and that's some people are very mad at their county appraisal district. They shouldn't be. They should it's be calling their, their state representative. Yes. So the state comptroller's office is mandating to your county appraisal district that they increase mm -hmm. values. Yep. Residential, ag, business, all of that. Mm -hmm. Your state, your state, state appraisal, your local appraisal district doesn't have a choice. Yes. There's actually a chart, and if they don't hit within 10% of the chart, they're penalized, and so yes. are you, and so is everybody else. Yes, so, that's right. Um, but it's your your legislature hard at work, and and they just opened the session, so good good luck for this session as well for all of us. Um, <laughs> So yes, a very fair point is that if your home said if your home value did increase, you could be looking um, at at something here. If your homestead value did not increase more than fifteen thousand dollars, then it didn't eat up your additional exemption, right? So if you went from twenty-five thousand to forty, and you didn't experience the same increase in your home value, then you kind of netted a gain there. But it's a big if. So I, I got you there. Very good point. Thank you. Okay, so we wanted to illustrate just kind of who's in the area and where people's tax rates are, uh, not to say anything other than just kind of illustrate where it's at. Um, and I think you can see most of the districts that are in your area here um, and, and kind of where you fall. Um, so as it, as it currently stands, and we talked, you did have some pretty significant tax rate compression that happened to you last year because of a pretty significant increase in assessed value. 
you are the lowest tax rate in your area. Not too far behind Dalhart, fractions of a penny, but I will tell you that on Monday or Tuesday I will be in Dalhart and they are going to be proposing to call, same thing here, their committee is recommending to their board to call a bond as well. So if that does happen, which I think everybody is in agreement, they had a pretty good sized committee too, is that they'll be going up this list as well. Um, so, yep, and, and that again, we're talking about the conditions that you find yourself in to be able to say what is the most favorable time period for us to even consider a bond. Um, is it now? Is it five years from now? Ten years from now? Is it ten years ago? Right? And, and I would say not too terribly long ago, a bond was considered for the junior high, and there were some circumstances that were, that were very favorable there. A low interest QSCB program that we got into where like six, six point one million of your dollars were on zero interest. I mean, there was some great stuff that happened to make that very affordable. The cost of construction at that time was probably 30, 40, 50 percent lower than it is today. I mean, there was some very favorable things. And so that's why I want to just highlight a few of these things so that you know that um, this is not being brought to you out of total in consideration of, of the timing of this and where we sit from an economic standpoint. So um, you are kind of lower, lower on the tax rate chart. So. This is representing what would happen if you were to add 22 cents to your INS tax rate. You could see you would, you would kind of jump to the middle of the pack there. Um, Dalhart ISD would also be moving up that list. I think the lower the lower ones there would be left with Booker, Wheeler, and, and Hartley, and, and really Stratford. Stratford has done some bonds in the not too distant past, same timing as you guys when that QSCB program was available. Um, Wheeler has not. Wheeler recently refinanced the one bond they have outstanding, and I'm not sure. I think Booker has done some renovations, but I don't represent them, so I'm, I'm not exactly sure. But I would say that if you probably went to those districts, you would probably not see the type of facilities that you have here at your junior high and, and that some of those other districts might have um, by some of the renovations that we've done. And the most extreme examples of that are obviously like Canyon, Canadian, where they just have experienced massive increase in values and, and just kept their, their tax rate rolling and, and kept replacing stuff over there. Um, we did work with Dumas this last year. They're building three new elementary schools there. Kind of similar to you guys. Oh, I hit that. That's probably going to be very loud on the on the recording. Um, kind of similar to you guys is um, Dumas had very, very old facilities at the elementary level, just really old, and they needed to be replaced. They were 50 and 60 years old, and, and they're growing in student population, so they did something similar as, as replace their stuff. So just kind of a list of what you have around and, and where you might fall. So um, <clears throat> we did have a few other options on this slide, and, and like I said, it has been narrowed down to just one project option which is composed of three propositions, which I'm showing in two different ways, and, and we'll talk about that. Um, so scenario one is obviously run on a 25-year term. It carries a little bit lower interest rate. Um, scenario two is run on a 30-year term. It carries a little bit higher interest rate. Um, the difference there is the most prevalent difference is the tax rate increase required for each one. It's not a huge delta. It's between 20 and 22 cents of increase on the INS side. The reason I'm showing both of these is um, I, I want to make sure that we keep a little bit shorter term option open, or at least put that out there to you, is all we have to do to keep that 25-year option in play is, is to communicate a potential $0.22 cent increase. That's it. Uh, we have full flexibility over how we structure a bond and what the term would be all the way through the date that we would potentially sell bonds, so many, many months from now. If we go out tomorrow and promote only a 20 cent tax increase, we may only be able to sell 30 year bonds. We may decide to split the bond issuance in two, in which case, like at Dumas, we sold the first half of their bonds on a 30 year term, we sold the second half of their bonds on a 15 year term. Just the restructuring of that second half of their bonds saved them $8 million in interest as it's structured today, right? But we allowed ourselves the flexibility to do some of that stuff by how we went out and promoted the tax rate. I think initially they were promoting up to a 44 cent total INS rate. They actually wound up setting a 42 cent total INS rate, which allowed us to do that fancy structuring. And I think this, this last August they, they were able to drop it down to 40 cents. So just because we go out and say, look, this could take up to 22 cents to get this done does not mean we have to set 22 cents either. 
if we're in a better position assess value wise at the time we sell bonds if any of those things the interest rates are a little bit better which they have been improving as the years gone on on the municipal side um, there's a chance that we could only need to set 20 or 21 cents to do the same thing that we were going to do at 22 it doesn't mean we have to set it it just means that we allow ourselves that flexibility and, and you guys you know I kind of have to provide what a projected maximum tax increase might look like so I wanted you to see this both ways now if you say look tax rate is going to be the total driver to this thing we need to go out and tell them the lowest possible tax impact that we can we can certainly do that and if we get to a point in the future and things are better it doesn't mean that at 20 cents we can't still do some of that creative structuring to save you interest it, it certainly does not I just want to show you as things stand today these are based on interest rates from the 25th we sold bonds in McCamey on the 25th so I took those interest rates and I added 50 basis points to them so I cannot predict the future any better than anyone else but I can go ahead and add a half percentage point of interest um, to kind of give us some breathing room to get through a May bond uh, if we eat up 50 basis points of increase in that time period then I can rerun projections if we don't eat up 50 basis points in that time period then we should come in a little bit better than what this shows so I'm making some con conservative projections as to as to where I think we'll land um, so we'll, we'll look at that too. So the next slide will show us just a little bit of, of the conservative nature here. John, can I stop you on one Yes. Thing? This slide has the same notation on the bottom of value from the Paladero Wind Energy Project. That 313 expires in 27, correct? So you're including the pilot payments? Yes. In, and the, in the income here? I am including the assessed value from the, from the Paladero Wind Project as projected on their annual report that they file every year. So your 1.22 billion in assessed value does include Paladura wins value from from this year, and they do every year update a sheet that projects the, their future the years. The abated value or the total value? It's their total value that applies to INS. Okay. The abated value only applies to your M and O side. Right, right. So I do have all of that value included. Okay. Yep. You also have some hold harmless. Um, it was hold harmless from the compression. It's about forty-six thousand a year in hold harmless revenue on your INS side, and that should last for future years as long as you have that outstanding debt service. I, I have that included in these projections too. So, some of that is included. Um, if I go ahead and pull all that stuff out, it would make it a little more conservative. It would also increase kind of our tax impact, like some of that other stuff goes up. So, sure. I, would, I would just when I saw Paladero, I just was was concerned or, or had a question. Of, where those funds were all of the money you receive on an annual basis for your 10-year abatement and all of the money that you received up front in lost revenue payments none of that is considered in this that would all stay where it's at which is hopefully which is back in M&O right okay. yep so what we're showing here as you said it's it's 36 37 that the that the current debt service runs through that's the gray bars represented there the blue bars represent the 39 and a half million um, of new debt that would be included in there as we said we're not exactly sure how we would sell that yet this is just representative it's showing if we sold it all at once let's just make sure that it fits under the mark right that it needs to fit under and that's what we're showing here um, this is the 25 year assumption so this would kind of be the most expensive quote unquote from a tax rate standpoint um, so you can see that the dark blue there does represent the new debt service you can see in that time period between 2036 and 2037 when the old bond pays off the payment on the new bond would increase to take up that room and you would just move on down the road okay. uh, the green line there is representative of, of INS tax revenue at 22 cents increase so 31 cents total okay and there is a little bit of white space there that's my conservative nature is like I said 22 cents may be a tiny bit more than what we need to make this happen but I want us to go ahead and plan on something like that and communicate something like that in case we need it. If we see an increase in interest rates uh, past 50 basis points, if our assessed value drops, there's a chance that that little bit of white space could be eaten up. And that's what I don't want to happen. So does right now as projections stand, does 22 cents a tiny bit more, maybe a half penny more than what we need as of today? Yes. Do I think it's sage for us to plan on that? Probably so. It does not mean that we have to use that when we get to that time point. We can, when we time to sell bonds, we can eat up all that little white space and take up all the conservative stuff out. But at that point, we'll know what interest rates are, we'll know what your assessed value is, and um, we'll have a better understanding of what we need moving forward. So, 
since we're six to eight months from that, I didn't want to ratchet things down so tight that, that we went up in a position where we couldn't make it happen. So that's, that's why there is a little bit of gap in there between the revenue line at 22 cents and where our bonds might actually fall. Uh, so again, leaving ourselves flexibility. Doesn't mean we have to set 22 cents, but if we plan on 22 cents, I know for sure we can, we can get this thing done. And, and as we discussed, we may wind up setting 20 cents. I that thing twice. Uh, we may wind up setting 20 cents. Um, so no, no issues there, just kind of a little bit of conservative planning there. You'll notice just normal tax increase for 22 cents is shown there on what, what we're saying is the average home value here in town. It'd be about $132 for the year. So property taxes on a $100,000 home, you can see the $40,000 exemption is included there, about 132 bucks a year the taxes would go up, or about $11 a month, and that's for total project. This next one simply represents the same project amount at 30, uh, I'm sorry, 20 total cents of increase or 29 total to INS pennies, exact same setup. I've just stretched it out to 30 years. So your debt service payment would come down a little bit. You can see that the 20 cents does also have a little bit of room there to make sure we can make everything happen. These are the same interest rates plus 50 basis points. So what we're saying is we would plan on only adding 20 cents to the tax rate which could in practice wind up being 19 or 19 and a half. Um, and for a $100,000 home, that, that longer term, lower annual payment would equate to about $120 a year or about $10 a month. So you're looking at 12 to $15 a year in savings or a dollar a month in savings um, by switching from 20 to 20 cents. Time number three, I apologize to those at home that continue to hear me hit that thing. Um, yeah, so there, dollar-wise, nominally for average taxpayers, there wasn't so much savings between those two amounts that I didn't want to present those two amounts to you and show you why we should probably look at 22 cents or a tiny bit um, more tax rate than, than what we're looking at. We should allow ourselves that flexibility to consider a shorter term. The savings between a 25 and 30 year bond can be millions of dollars in interest. Um, and if we wind up splitting the bond into two separate bond sales based on our construction timeline, um, then, then you can significantly shorten terms on those second bonds. And, and we've had a lot of success doing that where there's quite a bit of savings, but only by allowing ourselves that tax rate flexibility. I did use 20 and 22 cents. Your tax rate is right now at a very even nine cent setting. I thought, okay, let's add a very even tax increase to that of either 20 or 22 cents. I didn't want to get down on the, the fractions of a penny there. So. Um, so yeah, on your average tax paying citizen, your average homestead value is somewhere between $120 and $140 for the year in increase to make this project happen. If those same folks had 1.5 or 2 kids in school, I would say that that would be a very nominal increase in annual property taxes to have these new facilities happen. I understand, you know, this kind of covers high school and elementary school, so it's the spectrum of age there. It also covers some stadium stuff and, and, and some stuff that's based around um, everybody attending events, so um, good stuff. Any questions um, on those impacts? Okay. Let's go to the next one. Uh, okay, so this is the exact same slide that we looked at before that showed us savings. And I'm showing you this because the next slide is going to show net dollar change, right? So what we're looking at there is the 2021 taxes due and the 2022 taxes due with the homestead exemption and compression. And down at the bottom is the, is the savings that that had. So for a $100,000 home, about $238 in net savings this year on their property tax bill because of those two items. You can see at the top that was $1.7 to 94 on your tax rate. And then in those two charts, state mandated homestead exemption went from 25,000 to 40,000. Okay, next slide. So what I wanted to represent, and this is purely representative, <laughs> and the, you know this information is for you right now and, and kind of determined as to how we would, would share that in the future. So what we're showing now is the impact of a successful bond on dollar taxes from 2021 to a projected 2023. Okay, so um, what we're what we're looking at is basically j just on the two project options there. So um, what we're saying is, since since the 25 year option is more expensive, it's on the left. Let's look at that. So we said, okay, on a hundred thousand dollar home, 
from 21 to 22, there was $238 in savings on annual property taxes. If we were to enact this bond for 2023, that same $100,000 home would still be saving $106 a year over what they experienced before. And that's a combination of um, the increase in exemption and the compression. We would basically be taking back all of the compression pennies, right? We'd be adding all 12.88 pennies back plus a few, but the homestead exemption would still be in place, which provides kind of a net in savings. So these are estimated numbers. I mean, not estimated, but rough numbers. I've got them down to the penny, but, but just bear in mind that there is some fluctuation here based on your home value. So for a hundred thousand dollar home, you would still be saving over a hundred dollars a year in annual property taxes to what you paid in 2021. And I think that's important to know is that the savings that we're experiencing this year would not totally be eaten up by a new project. Now, as your home gets more and more expensive value wise, that prospect change changes a bit. The $40,000 of exemption doesn't impact a, a more expensive home as much as it does a less expensive home. So those numbers do change a little bit, but for your average homeowner here, they would still be experiencing a net savings in property taxes over what they paid in 2021. And again, that was at a higher tax rate too. So um, you, you would in essence have a higher tax rate in the future, but still have, have dollar savings to your public. So again, I, I don't say this to try and sway anyone, but when we talk about the conditions that we find ourselves in right now to be able to consider a bond, um, this is one of those things that provides a condition that says, well, I mean, if we're in a place where people can still save quite a bit of money and we can still get the project that really sets us up for name your number of years in the foreseeable future, this seems like pretty good timing. The farther we get away from 2022, when the, when the exemption went up, when this compression happened, the farther we get away from that, the more people start to lock in that higher savings amount, um, you know. Well, people I, just paid their 22 taxes, so they aren't gonna care what happened in 2021, in my opinion. You know, we just paid our 2022 taxes, that's what they're gonna say. Let's compare it to 2022, not 2021. That's correct, that's correct. So your average taxpayer will not say that, but as board members and committee members, I want you guys to understand the dollar impact that it's having on them, even if that's not what they're gonna come forward with. Yeah. So, and, and if you go, just go back two slides, Maria. Other way. Oh. One, keep going, one more. That's the most expensive scenario there and that's showing the tax increase. This is what we would show to your public, yeah. right? This is what we would show to your public. But when somebody from your public comes up and tells you why $132 is too expensive to have all of these potential projects, I want you to have something to be able to tell them, look, if you just pull out your bill from 2021, you're still at about $100 less than than what you are now. So it's, again, it's it's, when we talk about the conditions of, of why we would call a bond, that's what that goes to. It's not necessarily the message we would take to your public because we don't want to misrepresent anything. No. I do want people to see what your tax impact is from right now when you're paying your county to what would happen in January of 2024, right? And, and that's that's it right there. So. But for you guys, since, since you're calling the bond, I want you to have some more context as to how that works. The, the one other thing I'll mention, and, and I, I just say this because it's being kicked around, like everything else happens in the legislature, gets kicked around and goes by the wayside. They're talking about increasing the homestead exemption from 40,000 to 70,000. So they may go up again on the homestead exemption, um, which would provide even more savings. And, and I, I'm not even running projections on that because it's so, <laughs> wishy-washy yeah. at this point that it passes like I don't even want to give you a false hope if that were to happen there could potentially be like a net a net zero increase or closer to a net zero increase in dollars for you guys but that would have to pass through the state legislature which is a bit pie in the sky as of late so we're going to just leave that totally out but again context wise I want you to know that that's being discussed is increasing the homestead exemption um, even farther so okay let's go ahead Pass my unpopular slide, which is next, and then we'll keep going to. Oh, other way. 
Okay, so one thing to mention too is, is over 65, those, those folks in your community that are 65 and over can apply for a freeze. If they have not done that again in 2022, please tell all your friends to go do that. Because of compression and the increased exemption, their dollar taxes are lower this year, lower than what they paid in 2021. If you reapply for your freeze in a year where your tax dollars are lower, you get frozen again at the lower amount. You can ratchet your 65 and over freeze down. So please tell everyone that whether you want to call a bond or not. In the event that a bond is successful, um, those that do have the 65 and over exemption will not experience an increase in tax dollars. You will see your rate go up, your assessed value on your own could potentially go up. All of that stuff can be reassessed. The amount of dollars that you pay will not increase above what, what you paid in the year you applied for your exemption, which is why it's important to go reapply this year if you're 65 or older. Um, is that you can you can save more dollars than you did. Pretty nice. Okay, so we talked about the propositions, and I'm going to cover this briefly. You, you probably don't have this slide in front of you. This is something I added um, last night. Um, originally, we wanted to try and fit pretty much everything into one proposition. Um, there was a discussion of, of just the need for all of the stuff. Uh, in talking to legal counsel, um, it was determined that we would probably have to split some of this out based on House Bill 3, which was in the 86th legislative session. We've done our best to split this in a way that we think is um, responsible to your taxpayers, but also the most favorable to the district getting the facilities that, that they need to have. Um, proposition A is the general proposition. It covers pretty much everything. Um, as far as renovations to the high school and Wright Elementary, any other general, general renovations, the purchase of buses, uh, it, it's the general category. It, it's it's kind of the, the all of the stuff that doesn't need to be split out on its own goes into that general category. The amounts out to the right and the amounts that you saw in the recommendation presentation are strictly estimated right now. We have uh, Greg Huseman and his group here from Huseman Contractors, and they're they're helping us <coughs> with those numbers. We had to make some estimates. So um, if if potentially next Friday you were to consider calling the bond, I'll have the document here with accurate numbers. Um, from Greg as to what we think we need for each one of these project options, but I basically took what we have now and, and kind of estimated. So Proposition A covers a lot, 34.1. 30, um, proposition B is the stuff that we had to split out because it's considered to be improvements to your stadium, and your stadium has more than a thousand seats. So as a part of House Bill 3, that was a big thing that came about was um, Athletic facilities, uh, general purpose facilities, there were some things, technology equipment like Chromebooks, those type of things now have to be called out as their own proposition. There are a lot of those now. These things fit into that category, okay? Um, so your stadium improvement proposition is kind of what I have it called up, up here, but it will just be a general uh, ballot proposition. Um, it's renovations to the concession stands and restroom areas completely. Um, also, what, okay, what can also be covered in that um, is construction of support facilities to the stadium which would be your coaches' offices, your dressing rooms, and your weight room facility. So if you look at the easels over there, that would be the red, yellow, and purple part of that middle drawing right there. So everything to the right is considered also a support facility for your stadium, including uh, concessions and restrooms. That can all be included in a proposition together. And I think the amount on the recommendation slide um, had a one where the three is, but we I, I just tried to basically split it um, semi-evenly as we said maybe 3.8 to, to complete that. Again, that's totally up to Greg's interpretation and we'll adjust that. So there's some pretty expensive stuff. Locker rooms are expensive to build, plumbing and all that, weight room, um, restrooms and concessions. So anyways, that would be proposition B. All right, so A and B cover pretty much everything that you're trying to do um, that, that has an impact either on your, your student buildings that you have currently or your stadium that you have currently or your future needs. Um, Proposition C came about the other day. <laughs> um, it's a bit of an abundance of caution. If you look at that middle easel over there, the green area there is kind of borderline as to one of the things that the legislature is having us call out as its own proposition. Not even as a part of Prop B, which I was trying to do as a support facility to the stadium. Um, because it's not big enough to host its own athletic competitions, because it doesn't have any seating for spectators in it, um, there are some things that make it a general 
um, a general facility, a general district facility, and since it, it does have turf and is geared towards usage by athletes as well as other people, um, then it, it does kind of need, the cleanest way to do it is to split it out as a third proposition, okay? I can set it up as two and put it in front of the AG. There are a few different ways to go about this with the AG's office, but we think that the cleanest way to do it is to just make it its own proposition. Um, it may end up being equally or the, an equal to or, or the least expensive part of it. I, I don't know that yet. That's kind of an assumption, but what we're saying is just that section is Prop C. It's the district multi-purpose facility. It is a covered um, space that does have turf inside of it. It would be used by everybody on campus as far as extracurriculars all across the board. A lot for inclement weather, which you guys tend to have up here. Um, so it's set up so that everybody has a place to come inside and use. I mean, that would be, you know, band, athletics, all of that stuff that, that would get to use that, that space. Um, elementary for just play stuff you know I mean you could have recess in there it's it's pretty general purpose so we did go ahead and put that as proposition C um, just as a cleaner way to do it we wanted to try and have two props in which that would have been included in prop B but we were having trouble figuring out how to make that a support facility for the stadium and I know that you know your teams will probably get warmed up in there before they go over to the field like there's a lot of things that were in favor of that there are a lot of things that were against it too so um, anyways, those are the three propositions that we currently have proposed. Again, the dollar amounts are going to get adjusted a little bit based on what our professionals tell us that we need to cover those project options, but will be adjusted and ready to go for next Friday when you, when you potentially make a decision. Um, the district would contract with the city of Perryton to conduct the election, so you guys would have a joint election with the city. The county doesn't have anything on their ballot this year, and this is not one of the election cycles where you can force them to run your election. So. Um, we had to be nice about that so you'd be contracting with the city um, the calling deadline is friday february 17th two weeks from today um, we tentatively have you recommended for a meeting next friday the 10th um, if you if you so desire to potentially put this um, on your agenda as an action item and, and maybe call a bond I said a lot. I tried to go he as quick as I could. Yes, go ahead. So if that happens, the voters really get to choose whether they go Prop A. They could vote for Prop A and not vote for B and C, or they could they could choose and pick what they're voting for. That's what the legislature's done for them. Most certainly, and and it's it's <coughs> good it's good, bad, and indifferent. It's kind of risky for you guys, and that with the Prop C on there, and I'm let's just say it costs between one and a half and two and a half million is that you put this bond up and only Prop C passes and you build a really nice indoor play facility and nothing else, right? And, and would it be a waste of your time and money? No, certainly not. It'd be a very nominal tax impact compared to what the, what the overall is too, but you wouldn't get the renovations to your junior high. And, and so we kind of tried to structure it on what we think from a community standpoint will also be most desirable for community members. Obviously, the renovations to your high school and elementary, to the all of the space inside of there, and I don't, I don't think we're promising quite what your junior high is, but a, a very extensive renovation to those facilities, um, we think would would be a, a popular community aspect. I know that your restrooms and concessions have been a point of contention for a while, so that that prop is there. Um, we weren't, you know, real sure how people would view the multi-purpose facility, but it that's is what only, it is. That's the only thing that's in Proposition C is that facility right. That green square. What if, what, how big is that? Because it doesn't look like it's going to be very big. No, it doesn't. What, if, what, if, yards um, turf? Okay. what would happen if a guy came in? What what kind of proposition would be if you went in and tried to build a home parking lot through that? Would that go in a proposition? See, too? I mean, I could put the proposition I, in, or I could put the parking lot in prop. Well, what I'm saying is we have a million, four million dollar facility with a five dollar park, home parking lot. Yep. So there are a couple of ways that I discussed with council as to how do we get that square included in Prop B as a true support facility of the stadium. One, it would have to have um, it would have to have seating for spectators, and to do that, that would imply that it would have to be able to house an athletic event. But in only 50 y yards long, you'd be hard pressed to figure out what we can have a parallel to meet in there. That's an athletic event. That's a roll up, roll up stands up in the corner. Yeah, we put our portables in for our uh, part of the meet in the ranger right now. So look, these are all cases that are still totally open to be made. And I, what I wanted to bring to you is what we kind of determined on the phone the other day after an hour and a half of me sitting in the parking lot talking to Jerry. 
what we think is most logical, but it's still totally open to interpretation. So, um, but as soon as the parking lot would go, what what area would that would go in in the property? Because that'd be something if, for the public. Because everybody complains about our home stand, our home parking, and our football. If if you wanted to include a parking lot for the stadium, it would go in Proposition B with improvements to the stadium. Right. Uh -huh. It had to be in B. The only thing I couldn't, on its surface, couldn't do is include that green square on the left in Prop B. And if I do that, then the entire thing becomes its own standalone proposition. And if, if people don't like the indoor part of it, then you run the risk of not getting coaches' offices, even weight room, even and throwing something systems. in there. Like I know a lot of the track meets you go to, they put the pole vault, the high jump, and a bunch of the track events indoor. inside indoor. And I don't know if that would kick it in some kind of category. It, it would. So what we were trying to do is make it a support facility to the stadium. What, what our council was telling us is that a lot of times that means connecting it to the stadium or having it included. We also kind of like used UT as an example as a higher ed facility that has their memorial stadium there and a lot of different things around it. Um, all of those are big enough to hold their own events and, and so there's still some discussion to be had there and I'm totally open to take suggestions back to Jerry as to some of the events that could go in there like powerlifting or potentially field yeah, uh, field I, events or some I of the know, events most all the, most all the places you go in track meets nowadays they do like the high jump pole vault and all that stuff inside the facilities and i didn't know if that would fall in that category i think if it. steve also has some slides that has the parking that you're discussing yeah, yeah i just i mean i just always thought that was a great idea right there in that corner because we don't need that whole practice field over there so you could put a parking lot and put some kind of home entry entry right here and put so, a parking lot in there maybe some okay, okay guys let me give you something here so, he's saying steve uh who is our bond council no uh, uh jerry, jerry is our bond, bond council and that was the bond council you used on the last or yep work law it's Orc a different law. attorney within work but um he's He's one of the best attorneys in the state. He works with Austin but, ISD in the city of Austin and a lot of a lot of different reputations. But he works with Attorney General determining how those things fit or not fit. They brought Jerry in as consultation when they created HB3 to give testimony as to what the effects of HB3 would be. And Jerry fought tooth and nail to have some of this be a little bit looser in those categories. So he was involved in the creation of these requirements. Um, not that he wanted to create them, but he was involved in trying to keep them reasonable. So Jerry's done a great job with, with working with lots of districts, and he's also giving me perspective on things that he knows from bond elections that just happened that are in front of the AG right now that are, like, getting pushback. So one of the things he said was, we can package all this in two propositions. Have your bond election, have them both pass, send it into the AG's office on the first bond sale, and if they don't have an issue with it, then it's fine. It goes through. If they do have an issue with it, you passed a bond. You're ready to sell bonds. You potentially even priced those bonds and haven't delivered funds yet. And then the AG looks at it and says, "Whoa, whoa, whoa, whoa! What's this? What's this two proposition thing, right?" And so there are several different ways to approach the AG. Um, just like that green line was a little bit higher than our debt service bars there. This is one of those things where I'm saying we just go ahead and make it a third prop. Um, I'm not sure it would be so terribly expensive that we couldn't figure out a way to accomplish it in the, in the near future, even if it didn't go through as a proposition. The parking lot would be very easy to include as a support facility of the stadium. And, and if you were actually able to host complete athletic events in that, and we were to put some bleachers down the sides there against the wall for, for spectators, that may all, also make it its own facility. Um, the other thing we got to be careful with is its um, desirability with your public and what we tie to it, okay? If that's gonna be seen a little bit more as an anchor than a buoy, and we attach that back to locker rooms, coaches' offices, all that stuff, then you stand a chance that if that proposition doesn't go through, you don't get those other facilities as well. So I'm not sure, unless we can include all of that in the stadium proposition, which I'll go back to Jerry and, and figure out if there's if there's a way to do that, then, then you would potentially still have three propositions. Um, it would be nice to get it down to two, um, but to do that, we do have to figure out how to make that facility a true support facility to your stadium, and just the fact that it's not attached and, and some of that stuff right now, it, it didn't appear that way on its surface, but I also didn't have like a full in-depth 
description of what, what may go inside of it, what might take place inside of it. So I'm, I'm happy to take some suggestions back to council and see. Wait, so this one has a yeah. this one has a weight room added where this one over here doesn't have it, right? right. Is that right? Mm -hmm. That weight room between the facility yeah. and the practice food. Yep, and all of that is a part of your stadium prop B. Yeah. Weight room, coaches' offices, locker rooms, all that stuff. So no matter what, if your prop B stadium thing goes through, you get all that stuff. John. Light yes. green, not the dark green. Yeah. You get the weight room, but not the, the big facility on the end. That's on the okay. okay. With that, I would like to bring your architect up. <laughs> there you go. He's hey. getting hey. 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 right. his done. <clears throat> Any more financial questions? <laughs> <laughs> Soccer into it. Yes, maybe. We'll make it okay. Don't go bring, anywhere. Bring me back up. I'm not going anywhere. Yeah, the, what I like to say, we'll get some dead time here. Is, is this long range planning committee has done a lot of work for and asked a lot of the hard questions, and I do appreciate them for their time and commitment to making this recommendation to you all. Okay. Okay. You want to sit down now? Yes. Okay. <laughs> Thank you, John. My name is Steve Butler. Uh, Wes knows me. I don't know that I've met any of y'all. Worked on the junior high project, which was a great project at its time. Uh, I need to kind of share with you, there's lots happened in the last 24 hours. <laughs> uh, what I've tried to do was to take uh, what Greg's budget was, which has been um, has been pro projected to your your uh, steering committee, and make it work in plan view, in plan. So, with that, the budget did not include that. Okay, it includes what is over here. So, just to make the budget work. So, and it did not include. It did, inc it did include the multi-purpose facility, but it did not include the weight room. So that's 5,000 square feet, uh, which has a number to it. So if you want to start with this, this slide here, then we'll, we'll, we'll do that. Or is it, you have the other slide that I originally gave to you? Which, one, which slide do you want? Uh, 5.1, or the, the other, the one that matches the site plan over here. I don't have Dr. That. Rock, okay. I don't well. Have but there's no weight room in these. N there is no weight room in it. It's just like that right there. Yeah, no weight room there. Yeah. So, um, <coughs> just to fit the budget. Uh, Greg sometimes creates magic and pulls facilities out of the air and it stays within budget, but I don't want to I don't want to say that he'll happen this time. With this facility, if you go back to the other one, Dr. Rock, sorry, this has concession, it has bathrooms, it has storage, co uh, athletic director, a um, coaches offices for 15, 12, 12 people, soccer, cross country, track locker rooms for boys and girls. This represents a training room. This represents the JV football lockers and the varsity lockers. Um, and support facilities, mechanical rooms, custodial, that kind of stuff. <coughs> so uh, this one shows the weight room facilities and all these little squares right here represents a station. Powerlifting one, uh, you know, maybe whatever, I don't remember exactly how many we've got there, but quite a few. And it leads on to directly onto the multi-purpose. This multi-purpose facility is not the width of a football field. And you can see we've got an end zone section, a goal post, and 20 yards. That's what's in the budget of a 30, $39 million facility. Is that the average size of the ones you all build? Uh, no, it's smaller. Smaller than the average one 
all the other schools would be Most of them would, would have a full width football field, depending on how many yards you want to include. After And this is easily expandable on this end. To down the road, you might want to increase the size up down the road. And you've got room in your, uh, your site to do that. I do have a plan that was not in the budget for parking over there uh, on the, uh, what direction is that? East side of the, of the, of the east. On the home side. On the west side of the, of the state. Home side of the state. I do have a, a design. I think it includes 130 parking spaces. Uh, any questions on this? Okay. Well, this was not, the soccer, this area right here was not originally in the, uh, what Dr. Rock and them have given me to design around. This was originally in the, orig the uh, original design of not only Coach Kirk, but also Coach Flowers back in its time, because he had a full, he had a full football field. <laughs> <laughs> he had big dreams. Oh, he had a he had quite a facility anyway. But well, the first one that we you and I designed did have soccer locker rooms. And it does now thing. too. Yes. Okay. Yeah. The first one we designed it had a larger some, some larger areas in here. It had it had equipment storage for um, uh, <coughs> groundskeeping and, and and storage for equipment like track equipment football sleds etc etc do you say much had a by meeting room in the middle of between we the had a rooms. film room in there we, so i've cut it back to fit the budget it was a much bigger facility than what this is do you save much by doing the skinnier part i mean so could you not here? make it with the width the same all the way down instead of teeing it there just having to go straight out from where well you're yes I, and I have a design for that too if you want to see it but the reason i did it this way is so you could continue this away. Yeah, no, I'm saying I'm saying back where the offices are. Could you not widen that out to be equal with the football field? What you have drawn all the way back? Sure, I can. You know, I just don't know how much money you're saving. I, I'm just trying to make these. Yeah, right. this indoor facility is not not a football length wide. No. So if we go to a different design, it's we'll play wide, soccer in there. It's going to change. Oh, I will say before you leave this, and, and then I won't talk a whole lot, but. Um, Without that weight room, it's pointless. It is. I agree. Because of what we have right now and the numbers that we're running through and the, of what we're trying to develop, we have to have that weight room. Mm -hmm. Steve, so, do you think that if you gave up the, the indoor facility that you could have the weight room and the parking? Uh, or just start with the weight room? a question for Greg. Well, that's why I'm asking. But just, if, yes, what are the, the plans for the, the old weight room if you move it over to here? The old weight room the, over in the existing... And, and the old it would be school. over here, yeah. isn't it? Yeah, right with there. existing white room. What do you do with your existing white room? We're going to keep that for basketball. basketball and girls that are already lockered over there. And you're going to see some other stuff there. So if they have the locker room, it's I mean right. a weight room where they don't have to walk all the way across that. What would it cost to get that weight room outfitted? outfitted. Around $260,000. dollars would say $260,000. Adding it to what you already have? Yeah, because you're going to still need the white room over there. So that'll be all new new equipment that goes in there. And I got that quote today from, and it's more of an upper level quote because they worked faster than the lower level people. Mm -hmm. So, and you got to have the rubberized flooring in a way. Oh yeah. So you don't care tear up your con concrete and stuff. But yeah, as you need to remember this multi-purpose. That's the word. That's a separate proposition yeah it could go could not go your weight room would be tied to your offices your restrooms concessions. he's saying up. that it's not tied that weight room's not in the no it's room. not but i'm saying yeah. you could could be in proposition b yeah that's what i'm saying so i mean we're talking another million bucks for that 50 is that another million dollars that another million 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 two for for the weight room yes sir. what about the park i have any I usually have to see that, and maybe if we have time, I, we can get that out. I, I, I haven't given that slide. I did give it to slide. No, we I haven't given the slide for the, way, for the parking lot over there. Yeah, I can, I can create that. It's a smaller facility. Is something we just need to go the size we need to go. Right. 
Well, guys, all, all this, the guys anyway. Yeah. Well, everything you're talking about, guys, nothing has happened because I got a board president sitting over here going, "We're just listening. We're talking. This is pie in the sky." And you have all of this drawings here, which are just kind of pie in the sky. They're suggestions. just drawings. They're just suggestions. Yeah, at least for, for rock throwing. Yeah, for rock throwing. So you have it. This is a starting point. It's not point. too far away. No. So that's, and I that's can redesign. I, I mean, I can pretty stuff. quick. I can get really there if, if you want to see what you exactly what you. I can be here again and next week, uh, showing you another de design. Yeah, Wes, can I jump in here someplace? I, I, I've got something that's been bugging me since the first time I was on the, on the school board. And um, I, again, I see the needs for a lot of this stuff. I'm not sure the last one, but I do see needs for a lot of them. One of the things we've been trying to do is do something with our band mm -hmm. facility, which has been terrible for years, and for, um, and for the arts in general. Right. Okay. So, I went up to a local artist. I'm going to show you an idea. You can throw stones at it, but I'm going to add to your project. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Hey, Richard, you hadn't seen the drawings, but on his drawings, mm -hmm. there is expansion to the band room and the choir room. And we oh, it. like he's got choir. Okay. That's, that's he wants a job. So, so what he wants. He wants your job. I heard my job. Did you draw Center the art. I heard a local <laughs> artist who's she comes very cheap and you know I don't have to pay her much. What I'm, what I would like to consider here, and this actually goes back to what the committee put together, is that there's a arts center, abandoned arts center, over on the east side of the high school, and they look at the exact location. You remember we bought the land from McGarris. When was that? When was that? West 10, 15 years ago. Oh, no, yeah, a piece of land. Twenty. Where the band practices. So with the band practice over here? Talking? No, you know it's over here. He's talking about our land. You're talking west, west. southwest of the school. Okay, we're talking, the we're talking west. west. Yeah. So I'm talking about locations. Yeah. That was 2000. But what I would like <laughs> to consider <laughs> that's across the that's over south and west of the church. I think is where that yeah. where that is. So west guys, I don't know if you see all this. I don't want to. I don't want to belabor because I'm interrupting the whole process here. But um, we need to do something about band. We need to emphasize the band, and again, this has been a pet peeve for a long time. I can see a building sitting across the street from the high school that would be an arts facility. It would be a band facility. It would be something, again, this is just throwing darts against the wall and saying, okay, we have something that we would call the Perryton ISD Center for the Arts or something like that. I think that would be good. I think the town, I think the interest would be in the town, and as long as we're doing pie in the sky stuff here. Mm -hmm. I think we need to really think about it. I, I would like to think about something like that. Okay. So that's okay. my, that's the sketch from the from the artist. Well, Mary do, and just uh, <laughs> to, so it does cost you a lot of money. <laughs> <laughs> She's lot of cost actually a lot of money. Of money. Of money. Of money. Of I kind of made it right. Let so, me go prop it up here at the restaurant. <laughs> Can we put turf in the performing arts <laughs> No. <laughs> no, so, and I put a, we put it in there just, again, it's an idea, and we've got a location for it. We've got the, we, and this is separate from some of the things you've already done, and I understand that. But maybe an amphitheater for you get where you get small one-act plays, things, you get small, the, the, the band could do some things in there. Something to reinforce those programs that, we, that we've neglected for a long time. Okay. Um, can I ask how detailed the, uh, this may go to the committee or it may just go to Arctic? We've got a general proposal here and you're at and you've made a recommendation. How detailed is the agreement? And do you have a list of things? Because, because I'm sorry, but even with the last thing here, this looks like a wants list to me. Okay. And it has to be a needs list because we're going to, we're talking about financials here in a second. Are you, are you looking at this, Richard? Did we? Um, the spreadsheet? The spreadsheet. The list of each of the projects. Yeah, yeah, but that, that's, that's, but I'm, I'm kind of curious. Don't, don't go in detail exactly what, no, that's not, yeah, okay. there's not enough detail. And, yeah. and so I heard the question is what kind of detail do we have? He has, he has slides of like the high school, of how he plans on the renovation of the high school and the band. I don't know the okay, I think that's one yeah, thing I need to, yeah, yeah, I need to look so at. I need to consider that. Yeah, yeah, I, I want to take a look at it. And he has that for right elementary too. 
Yeah, the locker rooms, the weight rooms, that, those things, yeah. I think we've all recognized the need to for <laughs> so, session stand. So yeah. I asked him this question. you got to have a start, guys. You have a blank piece of nothing. Mm -hmm. So all he's done is started this. There could be a lot more detail in refining and right. moving stuff around. Yeah. So if, don't if pin might, anybody with anything. Yeah, so, if I might interject just a little bit. I think for us as a community, what we're here for is to try to get the school board to put a bond before the voters so that we can get started. I think some of this and I think school board interjection as to how the renovations are done is very important and we do want to address the needs of every everybody. This isn't about sports, this is about band, this is about classroom instruction, making it so a second grader doesn't have to sit in their class with their coat on all day long because it's freezing in there. That's what this is about. But what I'm trying to say is, we're just here so that you guys will make a decision. Will you put the bond before the voters so that come May they can vote on all of these propositions and decide they want them or they don't? And the details of how big the weight room is, whether you have a parking lot or yeah. you don't, those are details that will, will be worked out over time between now and the time, you know what I mean, that we put this before the public because we're very pressed on time and we need this before the voters in May, not in November because in November, historically, bond elections don't pass. So we want to try to get it in May. So the details that are important can be worked out later. We're I only here to try to get a room. couple of questions here that well, I have sorry. just okay. going through and I think we'll address it couple of things that you just said um, a couple of just general questions that I had going through your presentation and again I had the one before it was updated for today you only had the, the two different options how is ESSER a benefit because you talked about Shay the ESSER funds yeah, sure. being a benefit how is that a benefit if those funds are already spent they're yeah they're committed can to I? a certain degree right can I talk oh, yeah, okay. Yeah. <laughs> okay the ESSER funds are a benefit because we are and I have Greg here. We are going to do the HVAC to all the buildings, so the heating and cooling is going to be kind of Pay put in with paid funds. with federal funds. Okay. So rather he's got than that out of his budget because that's already been paid for and already been taken. Yeah, care. we would have to add that to building costs like normally you would have to. Do. Still, okay. There's no okay. other time. You have a time like, limit on that though. Don't remind me of that one. Yeah, you have a time limit on that. He knows. Greg knows. Okay, fair, fair enough. And Electrical fire like hazards. Some of the windows that they're replacing with those two. With gas or money? Yes. Right. Joe, do you want to speak about electrical? Yeah, so I mean. Because this is the first we've heard of any, any. electrical concerns at any building in the entire time I've been on the board. <laughs> so you got maintenance guy here too. <laughs> Alan. Well, it's kind of self-explanatory because in 1960 they didn't have computers. Yes. We that Some of those classrooms have like two plugs now, I mean, I think that's what I to we're going totally into understand that. What I see time and time again, I think it's Humble. three different references of electrical fire issues. Hazard. That's going to raise a concern on the part of someone. You know, that is that over inflaming an issue. If we need to provide additional amperage to classrooms, you know, that's something that's fairly. It's not easy in a 1960 building, but fairly easily. He's probably trading off LED lights for plugs. Right. LEDs. Which is what we did at the junior high. Well, Alan, just yours and my conversations all the time. They need to take the microwaves out. They need to take all these little things that teachers put in the room that those are breakers all the time Space because heaters. we don't have. Well, basically, our, our high school and our right elementary is the electrical systems are at max. Mm -hmm. I mean, we, okay. we're, there's no more. But do we have concerns of fires or tripping breakers have, because we're overloading? When you have power strips plugged into power strips and extension cords, and I mean, it is, it can become a fire hazard, mm -hmm. there's no doubt. Okay. And it's been like that. But we want to be careful how we say this. Right? Yes. yes. Yeah. Because that, that creates quite a concern. Well, Transportation a issues, issues, are those due to the age of our buses or maintenance issues? Did you do any research into, into that? Uh, be honest with that I'm not sure if that was brought up to us with the activity buses and just I guess been recent breakdowns I'm assuming from the age is what I'm assuming what age and maintenance it I'm could saying. be both it was both cool. I think the issue there is we don't want any student caught 
two hours from oh, here. Oh, of course not. No, 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 no. We understand. Of course not. Really. I bet that's, that's, that's the most reliable, most reliable bus. Yep. Yeah, the old yeah, old activity yeah, yeah. Guarantee that old red one. death. Can I go? Pre-death. Pre-death pre bus. There we go. still rolls like a champ. Yep. Have we had any discussions on student logistics during construction? <coughs> any additional costs due to that, like the building that we bought for the junior high so we could shuffle kids in and out as we were doing it in, in the three phases? Greg, did you do some planning on that of the phases if we get start construction at the high school? Uh, um, and I didn't really uh, 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 put any additional money in there for that. But in, in, in a, typically, when you go and renovate buildings like this, it's different than the junior high. And uh, because you have a tendency to uh, go in there and do, uh, you know, maybe six rooms at a time. Mm -hmm. and, and you try to get those done in about somewhere anywhere from six weeks to, to three months, depending on what has to be done. And so you, you kind of, if you can give us six classrooms, you know, we, you know, we just basically would work our way through the building. Right now. And in you know, order the junior high, we were doing pretty big areas out there. So it's right. really dependent on how many classrooms y'all can give up. You know, we're over at the lab like school right now, and they gave us nine classrooms at once to do. So what's the max so amount of rooms that you could do at one time? Uh, probably as many as you can give us. Right. And that's at both that's at both campuses? That's a, yeah, to the right ten, ten, ten we would shoot for about six. Yeah. Other than it being quicker, doing more rooms at once, is there a cost yes. savings in doing more at once? You know, yes, because we, while you're running, you basically have supervision and, and, and travel and those things kind of, so if you, the more you can do it once, the, the, the less that cost is. Yeah. So you, the last we spoke with him too, he said that, you know, that the high school renovation and RIOT can be simultaneous. Yeah, mm -hmm. right. they're, they're not going to be one in the other. see the sim simultaneous projects. Yeah. And I, I will say this, right now, right now, there are some vacant classrooms at the high school. And there are some vacant classrooms at right. Yeah, to go along with that, I would, I would coming from the still that same 313 agreement, when I was looking, I found a page in here that I'd forgotten about uh, that had our building capacity uh, of 2994. You know, we've got total students, what do we have right now, Brittany, ADA of 19, uh, 19, 19, 19, 19, 10, something like that. You know, so, so there's some space to be able to do that. And I, I was thinking that'd probably be what the plan was, but I just wanted to make sure that we had. Said it out loud so anybody that's listening can hear. I'm always amazed, you know, how they, they kind of take on the life of their own once you get going. And people, uh, you know, people get spaces and it seems to work out pretty well. Mm -hmm. uh, but well, one thing I'd like to say just, you know, when you're talking about when, when do you make decisions to, uh, to, to do things, you know, it's now or later. But, uh, you know, we've, we've uh, based all, all the estimates and stuff off of. Really, it's eight eight uh, different schools that we've added to, like, added on to and renovated over the last, you know, uh, several years, and uh, and it, that, that, that's kind of where the experience comes from and, and the numbers come from, of, of what things will cost. But I went back and looked at just the uh, the Perryton Junior High over there. We did that in four phases, and uh, on the first phase, you know, when, when it came to pricing things out, when we draw the plans, we try to do it in a way where we have options. It leaves us choices to make because there's always a wish list that come up during the even now or during you can uh, draw in the construction <coughs> plans you know, the, you know so you'll all, you all be looking at one say I'd like to have a number for this or that on phase phase uh, one we had th 30 options on, on the first phase when, when it came time to sit down and make decisions and th those totaled a million dollars remember uh, that, uh, that. Uh, just choices and, uh, and and they they ranged all the way from a thousand dollars to 156 thousand you know, and there, but there were 30 different choices to be made, and and in phase two there were there were 20 options ranging from uh, uh, from about 3,700 dollars to 120 thousand, you know, 20 options to choose from, and uh, they, which totaled about 400 thousand. And on phase three there was 28 options, range, you know, total about 400 thousand, ranging from about 3,700 to 80 thousand. And on, on phase four, you know, when we got to the very end, we actually were about 300 thousand dollars below budget at that time and that's one reason why we went in and reno did the renovations and stuff in the uh, in the gymnasium over at the gym and, and renovated the, uh, the dressing room it really wasn't in the budget but we hoped we could get to them and we were able to get to them and get them done and we had about I think we had even 20 options at that time so in that whole project we, we actually priced out going into uh, the plans and getting prices of about 100 different options and so you know as you 
would draw the plans for the uh, elementary and the and the high school and the the, the stuff out there at the football field. Uh, you know, I, I, I would anticipate you know somewhere between 100 and 200 options possibly. Mm -hmm. Over at the Farwell School, we did that a couple years ago. And we had 160 options to say yes or no to. You know, so th th that, that's how you manage the budget as as you go through the process. So ha so say that we approve this thing next Friday. How long will it take to drill down the details? Because what I don't want to do is not be prepared. I, I, I can't sit here and tell somebody in the community, oh, this is what we're doing. Like, are we out of time to do this? Because, I, like I said, last time we had videos that we sent out to the public of renderings of walking through the school. Like, and, and now we're saying, well, let's get it done and then we'll worry about the details. Do you remember the, yeah. the fog election? I do, that's what I'm saying, because yeah, we weren't prepared. We weren't prepared, and the only way to get this thing through is get all the community on board and show them, here's what you can be proud of, not just say, well, we're going to do it, and we hope that it turns out. Yeah, we need $40 million, just trust us. Yeah, and, and are we going to be ready in 60 or 90 days to do that? Guys, I, that's my more, question. I was involved in a $100 million project yeah. building a brand new high school. From the time you pass that bond till that thing's actually built and everything, it's seven years. <laughs> And something like that. Well, it, it so is. you're going to have time to do that. But I agree with you. And well, we're voting. In, we're voting in 90 we're days. We're not voting, voting in seven years. Well, no, it'll be 75 days. But it'll we'll be, be funded two weeks thirty and ribbit. Yeah. So I would like John to speak to that because he's trying to raise his hand. About details is <clears throat> this, the way that a, the way that a public bond works. You're at a bit of a disadvantage for details. Okay. The state requires that you provide an amount to call for. Right. The amount can't be determined without a floor plan. The floor plan can't be determined without a cost estimate for that floor plan. Um, but none of that can be truly fleshed out in detail until you have money to do that. So to get a detailed, let's just say, construction drawings, it's going to cost you the price of architectural design, engineering, all of that stuff. So if you want the details, you can pay for it ahead of the bond and run the risk of the bond not passing, and now you pay for the details. And that's what we did last time. It's what okay. So I guess no. where I'm going with that is what what these guys we are didn't pay for all that. What what all do we have? We had all those. We had with all of the fly through. I think I think the, the the flyover, the rent, the you know walking the, through the halls. Yeah, that's all, that all general. That's all. I general. didn't charge anything. Okay. I, I'm not. I mean, I'm on. I'm, I'm taking the risk. And I guess that's what we're saying okay. is when you guys think of details and when these guys think of details, there's probably a little bit of a detail gap there. In that when Steve thinks of details, he's thinking of construction drawings, no. which means. What you know? What kind of tie-ins? How many inches to the ceiling? You know, it's like yeah. we think of details. We think of the fly-through, right? So, can we have something similar to the amount of detail for the fly-through? Yes. The other thing you want to be careful of is you don't want to paint yourself into a detail box yeah. before you have the money. It's like once the money is in place to renovate your junior high and elementary, you want these guys to sit down with your high school and elementary teachers and find out how does this need to be renovated, not us trying to make that decision that. now. Yeah, guys, I, done I think, I think the, my point was, and to address Shirley's point earlier, I'm not worried about the size of the weight room. I think looking at the weight room, we, need, we know what we need to do. But I'll need more detail of this because what Bryce is saying is correct. We're going to have to go. We're going to be the ones some, answering yeah. the questions. Right. We've already Certainly. had a couple of experiences here lately that weren't weren't defensible, mm -hmm. and we did leave it. We did leave one bond history item off the list here, and that was the one that got beat when we went to do something with the junior high school and build the new high school when I was on the school for the first time. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we tried to rush that one through too, and we get we lost a lot of support. And I've heard a bunch of statements in the last few weeks about. How everybody supported most of the bond elections that isn't true okay so we've got to be careful here about how we present this question to Greg um, if we have those estimates that we're basing all this on the 39 million dollars that's based on current construction costs plus some kind of escalator how are we doing this you know we you know I've gone back and looked at what things have have cost and then I basically have added really a 35% increase, you know, from a year or so ago. So, uh, okay. To, to, Even to, though to, we're looking at a, what do you say, James, seven-year construction project length? Uh, well, it, won't, it won't be seven. It won't be that long. That was 100. Three. That was probably in Kansas. <laughs> and in New York. We're talking about two and, and a half three years. years. From, from, the three. From, from when we start construction, I'm anticipating, you know, about two and a half to three years. Wow. I don't know how mm -hmm. fast we can get through that'd be good. Well, I do know we're having trouble keeping track of the expenses, you know, even on the M&O side, food and all that kind of stuff. I mean, so 
I'm trying to get at how good is our $39 million number? And I don't believe in telling the taxpayers to just give us the money and trust it. That's yeah. California. And trust on this sheet here that you have that 35. That's what that inflation rate is. Okay. 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 Overall. But actually, what I think, <laughs> what I think is actually going to happen in the next year, you know, what, what I'm starting to see happen is yeah. prices, yeah. Like prices are coming down. Uh, you know, people on the labor side, you know, in the last few years, you, you were hard to, you were pretty hard pressed to find people to do the work or even to show up because now, I'd say in the last several months, I'd say on a regular basis, somebody's walking my office looking for a job. Yeah. And, Interest and, rates of contractors are showing up. Stop. So, yeah, some, some of that contractors building. are showing up, say, looking, you know, dropping their cards off, yeah. and that's what I would, you know, what used to happen, and that's starting to happen again. And I think that's even going to continue to happen more over the next, hope over the next uh, year or so. Richard, right. your point too. I would say that it's not necessarily give us the money and trust us. It's based on two hundred dollars a square foot per renovation give us the money that we need to accomplish what you want us to from a renovation standpoint right so to drill down the details of renovation would be largely impossible I would say as we stand today even to accomplish that prior to calling a bond if you push your bond till next November I don't know if we could come May. up with the details May. of the May. renovation May. Next May. November is gotcha. not a consideration for my part gotcha it's no. this May or next May so I am I not in any way shape or form opposed no, to, heck no, to a bond issue. No. No. Yeah. We have no. the needs. How are we going to make it happen? The schools I've been it, involved in that do bonds, we're going to have to hustle. Like it don't matter how much time there is, you have to get out in the community. Oh, you most have to definitely. Have meetings. You have to inform them, yeah. and more than one. But we might have to go to the church. <coughs> and do it. Yes. I mean, it's not. It yeah. can't just be um, come to Ranger Gym. Most, on most definitely. Yeah. Yeah, most definitely. Which is why my concern it's about the seventy-five day time frame forever. of being able to get enough information out. To be able to provide a positive report from a bond issue again, 75 days from when we would would vote to to do it is not 14 months a better time frame to make everything work. And even I know you're not a predictor of interest rates, John, mm. but you know swap rates are off mm. seven tenths since October. Uh, if you look at what the Fed's talking about, thinking that maybe they've got tap the brakes a little bit to be able to start backing things off. What do we save by being able to knock a point off or a point and a quarter off come 14 months from now? So you, you, if rates go down, you do stand a chance to save some interest accumulation. Also, if you're able to do a 25 instead of a 30-year bond, you save. Also, if we structure, um, my fear is that potentially if, if construction doesn't cool off as, as quickly as we'd like it to, you may gain some, cost, some, do, some project balance. costs between now and then. So you may just totally offset yourself. Um, but from the community standpoint, they would see it as getting more expensive. Now, we've experienced that most heavily in the last 18 to 24 months with what's happened with the cost of construction. So if it does come back down, um, the one thing I will say about timing, and, and if you'll remember with the junior high bond, we did have several meetings, mm -hmm. public open call meetings at the auditorium where people came to learn about the bond. And they had some good questions. They did. The public and had some great questions. Some, some were well attended, some were not. I think as, it, as, as time got closer to Election Day, enough people had come to hear the information that were going to come hear the information right. that they'd gotten their fill, right? And, and so we ran into that. I will tell you that I've had bond success with districts that have decided to call a bond two weeks prior to the calling deadline. Wow. I've had bond success with districts who have started a year and a half ahead of when they called the bond and gone through it. I've seen failure the same way, too. So the message and what you're presenting and what the project need is largely determines for me what what the reception is with your community. If we were proposing a brand new football stadium with that indoor facility off the end, um, we would probably need a year and a half to get people's mind around that. What we're proposing today seems a lot more palatable. So from a communication to your community standpoint, as one of the people who will be here again for those meetings with your public now, there will also be meetings that potentially James and Dr. Rock take that are with your Rotary on a Wednesday at lunch. You know, there will be meetings that we won't be here for, but they'll be using the same materials and same presentation. I do think that between, and this is what the legislature set up, is the calling deadline and election day, right? Um, some districts do choose to have a public meeting prior to calling to make sure that they're not gonna be met on day one with pitchforks and, and flames. Um, well, I, that's already happened. 
Mm -hmm. Oh, I'm sure. I'm sure. And you're going to get that. So the question that you ask yourself is what percentage of our community is that, right? Are those the same people that are mad about everything, or are those is that everybody in the community? But I don't think we know yet, John. I mean, this is the again. Some of the stuff is the first time we're seeing this. I don't think we know what kind of response we're going to get. And I, although I, I respect what the committee's recommending, I know they've done a lot of work here. By the time the dollars are put in here, we're going to have to actually look at it. That's what I'm saying. Again, I'm not worried about size of things. I'm look, looking at actually project items is what I would want to look at. So. So here, and here's, let me give you my financial input here. You've got a, uh, this is not an isolated thing. I, I mean, you know, INS is not an isolated thing. We have the MNO budget, we have, comp, and we have other taxing entities in the community. What happened in the last, back, the last collapse in the oil and gas thing is, and I'm quite, actually quite proud of this, that with, with, with the way the state worked at this, we were able to, um, make sure that our cost stayed within the compression rates, okay? So actually, while all this was falling apart in the local community there, we were able to cut rates, okay? So I think that was a good thing. But at the same time, we have other entities in this town that, and Carrie even throw a rock at me, uh, <laughs> <we sit in. laughs> but there are other taxing entities here that turn around and raise taxes through the, through the roof. So by the time we look at the cost of housing or rental housing, here in Perryton, they're not looking at what, I mean, I can talk to people all day long about what their INS rate is and how we, or the MNO rate and how we've reduced it. They don't see that. They see what their house pay, they see what their payment's gonna be. And so it, it, it's a big picture thing here. So let me paint a picture for you because I tried to address this when I'm back when, when I was making my little political job, was presuming the oil and gas prices are headed down right now, okay? We have an M and o, we, we have an M and O budget to run off those current taxes, correct? Mm -hmm. Okay, so I've got to fund that. I've got I, I said this in the November meeting, we've got a COLA, which is what I think Sarah asked me about the other day. We've got a cost of living adjustment we're gonna to have to look at for our staff. So it's not a, it's not the standalone thing on the head of a pin. We've got to look all the way around the head of that pin. And so if the M and O rate has to be raised, again we're back saying uh, we're back saying we're going to have to raise your taxes, okay? So, so there needs to be some flexibility in that. Again, that's not your problem. We're talking about facilities. I understand that, but but you're, from our perspective, or at least from my perspective, since I'm the, I'm the one talking here, the tax rate is the tax rate to the homeowners in Perryton, and we we felt like we didn't. Some of us felt like we didn't have choices but raise everybody's taxes. That doesn't help the community. That doesn't help the community grow. We have a, we are, the last time I looked, we were 43% of our budget was based on, uh, was based on oil and gas properties, production properties. Another probably 15% or something like that was based on service company. And we've lost a bunch of service companies. We've lost our tax base. And while I'm happy that, the t that they're raising the home exemption, what you're doing there is you're actually trying to avoid election issues, right? But you're also uh, reducing your tax base. So, how do we, how do we, if we assume that we're, because the thing that kills us in Perryton, Texas, is we go out and we have this great big increase in our tax base because oil and gas comes in. And then two years later we have a great humongous decrease, and I think the, the first time this occurred to me was we, had, we were talking about uh, riff, we've done a reduced reductions in force because because of the, the, the hit on the M and O side. So please understand here that I see the needs here, but when I ask about what we need and what we want, every time I see one of these bond elections, I see a ton of wants. I see some necessities that the community will support. They'll just go out there and say, "You bet, we need to do that." But they can vote for that proposition. They, then. Yeah, but you've got it all stacked in one, James. You've no, got no most we've got we got A for school. Okay, you've got stack you've got most of it stacked in one, let's just say it that way. Okay. You got so the question is can, is it sellable? I'm kind of I think I heard Wes going this way. This is gonna be a big sales project and Sarah put her finger on some marketing thing to the community. If this was a small thing, let's go let's go back and do one campus and I have the a question mark right here in a second. That's easy to do on a short-term notice because everybody says we need to do this. This size of project, I don't, I don't see this happening that quick. 
and I know that's going to disappoint a lot of people, but we need to, everyone I've been involved in, we allocate much more time on trying to educate everybody and bring everybody up to speed so there's generally a support level in the community that will support us without us getting everybody lynched. Okay. So let me ask this question, and I'm just going to ask it because we have people watching this right now, hopefully. I don't know how many. Okay. 18 people? <laughs> Real good. Good for them. Good for them. But this is going to get out. Okay, this is the first time this is going to get out now. Okay. It's going to get hot. Do we have a meeting sometime next week and invite the public just so you got a temperature gauge? Next of, week? Yeah. Because you got to make a vote Friday. If if you choose to, well, but you can you push, don't it, two weeks. You push it two our, weeks. Our right? next meeting is the fifteenth, our regular meeting, yeah. mm -hmm. which would be pushing it real close because that's two days away 17th. from the seventeenth. But still, it's it's okay. the seventeenth is the seventeenth. We would have a meeting there mm -hmm. to be able to approve uh, if that's the deadline from the state. But I'm saying you could still have a meeting prior to that to get you a water temperature, stick your toe in the water, and see if it's hot or cold. I would be reluctant to have a noon meeting. For no, that. not noon. You're saying Just an because evening. Of being able I'm saying an get, evening get for the public. Or, yes, because okay, 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 I, I was thinking about the, the next Friday the 10th, which would have to be a noon meeting. I would be reluctant yeah. for that just so people could attend. Yeah. If, I want, if we're going to do something like that, we need to make it very, very easily accessible, probably to move the location. Yes. Yeah, I would say the high school auditorium, invite the public, dip your toe in there and find out what you got. You no, know, last time, didn't we do some walkthroughs at the junior high and show them here's what we're going to do? A lot of that stuff ahead of time. And then here's what it's going to look like. Well, guys, I... Because anybody that's walked through that high school knows that yeah. something needs to be done. Absolutely <laughs> yeah. needs to be done. Anybody that's walked through that weight room or any of the Coach Hab's offices, well, and, and I you know it needs to be done. I asked Greg just not too long ago, this junior high we just we yeah, all right. did a few years ago, it's a beautiful building. It's a nice building. It's functional. With that. I asked him if you built that today, what would that cost you? And you would go from twenty million to thirty-five million. Mm -hmm. it's not it's not surprising. Surprising. Yeah. Easy, easy. So we've waited and waited, and every time we wait and wait, it doesn't get cheaper. Yeah. But so ready, I'll fire, see. aim is not okay either. No. There's two uh, points. I want to give one piece of perspective too is that a lot of people rely on the committee to represent a cross section of their public. Although it's not, sometimes you want more people to participate in the committee than what you actually get. Um, in my experience, if you put yourself in a position to allow your entire community to give you the indication to call a bond, it will never get called. You can't get that many people on the same page to make one decision in one direction. If you take the recommendation of your committee, who is supposed to be a general cross-section of your community, and just rely on that to get the bond in front of your actual community, then it will actually get called. A lot of times if the board cuts out the committee and, does, and just takes a unilateral action, sometimes they get ahead of themselves and call it too quickly. The fact that you've involved a citizen's committee as a cross-section of your community to this point, let's just call it six months to a year worth of heavy involvement in kicking these ideas back and forth, I would say that you probably at least have yourself the platform to get it in front of your public. Um, if you want to take that platform down to the public level and have your entire community give you the confidence to call one this one project scope, um, it's not that it won't happen, but I rarely see one community all in one direction on one issue, I guess is the point I'm making there. So at some point it comes to the boardroom for you guys to make a decision. And I think importantly, the decision that you're making is not yes or no, do we build the project? It's yes or no, do we put it in front of our public to give them the opportunity to support it or not? Regardless of circumstance, tax rate, oil up, oil down. And, and I've, I've looked at your historical value and, and what happened with oil and all of that stuff. And, and I know that the state has compressed the tax rate. By formula, the state will uncompress your tax rate if values drop. So there, there is some ebb and flow there for sure. Um, but I think you guys are acutely aware of that. Your community is not so acutely aware, aware of it. To Bryce's point, what they care about is what are my dollars, right? What, what am I going to pay regardless of what happens with the tax rate? So I guess the point becomes you're putting something to your public to determine what they would what they would like to see happen with the school district 
and not trying to make that determination here between the seven of you before they make that determination, or you can trip yourself up, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. You can put yourself in a vicious cycle of trying to make that determination in a boardroom when really it's let's get it in the street. And it's going to be their them. decision anyway. At the end right. of the day, it's going to be yeah. their decision. Right, and let's get it out to them. If they love it, great. If they hate it, then we can, we can redraw, we can repackage, we can come back to them. We can at least garner feedback from that group to say, what did you not like about this project? Tell us where we went wrong with this because we had a really good group of people from this community tell us this is what they thought was popular. Come participate on the committee. And these guys worked at it for a year. Yeah, I mean, I was on that committee I before us sat here. The overwhelming majority of the committee was, okay, so more of a breakdown of the 39 million is 24 high school, 15 right. Was not to do high school and then come back in five years and do right. You're not going to do that. You're not going to no, get one bond pass and come back in three years. Oh, let's do it again. Well, we just did a bond. We talked about going to do another one. It's going to it, it was we yeah. wanted it all yeah. one but, time. Was, yeah. Yeah. What about the, the kindergarten? It's just as old. Yeah, the kinders. Well, the and kindergarten the is getting new windows because of the ESSER mm -hmm. funds. So we felt like the kindergarten was getting something that was needed. And I, and I can tell you all, honestly, the number one concern with every single person in this committee was we want to improve what we have because as a real estate agent, and Bryce would attest to this too, you don't get people to come to your, com <coughs> to your community when you do not have a good school. No. Because that is what people look at when they have little kids is they want their kids to go to a good school. We so if you're going to draw really people to your community and draw your tax base up, then you have to have nice a, a nice school. And it was for the kinder, for the reason we decided kinder is one grade level, these yeah. others are seven. Well, but they're also talking about yeah. your, your universal pre-K. Right. And, but there was some, I'm not, I'm not going to disclose it, but there was some other discussion that I had about how that would work, possibly. Yeah. But, yeah, but I think that's another kinder, we and know it, the kinder's an issue. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And again, issues. I think for me, I just want, let, let's let the public decide. Y'all, if we put these propositions out there and they're all voted down, then I guess the community didn't want their taxes raised and they didn't want to spend the money to improve their schools. So that is the God-given right of each and every one of us to vote on whether or not we want each proposition or we don't. So I, I'm just asking that we give the voters a chance to decide what they want. Let them decide. After we educate them. Yeah. Yes, yeah. agreed. Yeah. Agreed. Yeah. agreed. You need to be that. educated. But agreed. I think the word palatable was whoever you said earlier. I think that, that that's a good word because it's it's you're still pitching this to somebody, surely. I'm not, I agree. And so agree. it has to be where they're convinced. I agree. The, the, the typical thing with a school bond to me, Johnny, correct me. A lot of times with the school bond is we'll throw a big number out there, and this goes from Amarillo to here two or three times. We throw a big number out there, and then we, we plan on getting beat. That to me is a waste of time. Okay. Well, I'm not planning on getting beat. Well, <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm gonna, yeah, I'm okay, good. Protest you there because I'm planning on winning. Okay, fair fair enough. Um, you know, a little perspective here. We. Um, we had, a, we had that bond election that I mentioned that and I've had some discussion with some friends of mine that the when the junior high came up we shopped for architects and okay, that's not throwing stones at architects but we shopped for architects and consultants the reason the high school was proposed on that original bond in 2006 or whenever that last that one that was not on the list here the reason we did that was because the architect and the, and the people recommended went in and condemned the junior high building. They condemned it, guys. The decision wasn't, do we go build a new high school? The decision was, we have a junior high that's not usable. We have plumbing problems. So I, I, don't, I need to come back and ask you a question on the right. But we have plumbing problems, we have electrical problems. Let's condemn the junior high. And that would have been the wrong decision. And I had some friends in town that straightened me out on that. But that would have been the wrong thing to do, right? And you guys were right. Yeah, and that building's was. beautiful yeah. right now. That's yeah. right. So when Shay made the That's presentation, what I heard there was, I mean, so again, I've got a little bit of jaded glasses here, having gone shoved down the chute a couple times. So I hear right, and we've got we've got uh, plumbing problems, we've got electrical problems, we've got. How long was the foundation the problem? Call, thermal, all of it. <laughs> okay, so and we got a. We, wasn't the right it's campus where we had the, the the foundation settling? Yeah. Is that stabilized? 
So are you, is not an option here to, to look at a new campus for right? Or you guys looked at this and said, okay, we've taken this structure. Now, where I agree with the prior one, that the bones of the junior high were really good. You aren't getting James Point. You can't build that kind of structure anymore, not for any kind of reasonable cost. But is right that builds it? Sure. Okay. We can salvage that building. If it makes it we want you to look at the cost benefit analysis on new versus yeah, renovation. Really, we, we've done lots of these kind of things throughout the state of Panama. I've taken an old building and making it look brand new. And that's my, some of what I've done up here, especially on the high school. All that red you see up there in the high school is new construction. And what you're doing there is you're putting up basically a new front on it. It will look like a new facility. Richard, I did ask Greg that question that you're asking right now. And Greg gave me the answer. Of typically, on, well, on every uh, school that we've gone on, you know, added, and a lot of times you'll add somewhere between 25 to 30 percent of, of new construction, then you do, you know, 70 to 80 percent uh, renovations. And when you, when you look at the, the entire thing versus new, you're about at 60 percent you're doing renovations. And that's a a fairly, fairly heavy renovation uh, versus new. And when you talk about plumbing, you, you take the plumbing all the way outside the building, you tie, you, you tie it in. Right. You know, the, the electrical, yeah. Uh, cut your cut concrete out, put new cut comes to electrical and you put, you put new electrical. And the water goes overhead. The, wa the water, new water lines. Okay, so just, that's what I want here. Because again, I went through the thing where they, the, the, the architecture and the engineering firms condemned. Yeah. I'll make a point. I was the only one that said, nah, we can make that work. Okay, fair that enough. That was the only so one. You were, you were right, I was I doing was. I wish I would have heard that voice. Let me tell you something. Because it was unsuccessful and the I, couple of us got thrown off the school. I love that doing that. adaptive use architecture. Okay. That's my favorite. When I was nine years old, I was a garbage picker. I'd go find, I would go to the little houses and I'd pick out a, a, a shopping cart here and, a, and a something else over here and I'd go make something. So that's my thing. But, but I even love it. Yeah, even you know, like the, uh, the right elementary and, and the high school, you know, even today to build that, you know, because you, you have block walls. Yeah. You, know, you, have, you, know, you have really good structure there. Right. He said, you know, it's, it needs to be insulated, the extra walls need to be insulated, you need new windows, uh, uh, you know, uh, the electrical issues need to be dealt with, the plumbing, if, you know, you, you basically take those lines from, from a, you know, you go into a restroom, you, you basically tear, tear, tear the floor out and you, go, you take your line all the way to the outside of the building, your new line. Yeah, I just want to make sure we were hitting the things that are actually critical. You can tell me that the buildings are usable, and that's the reason we're not proposing a new building here any place. Right. You, you got it. We know that. that. You bet that the new high school was 24 remodeled. I think they're saying 60 new. Yeah. And that's just high school. I don't know what a new ride right, would Yeah, it's getting to the point where nobody can build any. Right. I mean, you're going to build huge amounts of, of debt to in order to construct any new campuses right. or buildings, right? So one of the concerns too is the communication piece is we will get the information that you're concerned about getting to them, the level of detail within cost reasons, not, <laughs> not paying for construction drawings, but the level of detail to your community through these presentations to anybody that, that is willing to come up there interest rate wise. If interest rates go back down, we don't lock rates until the day we sell, which would be after you get your certified values in July. If rates drop 50 basis points by then, then we lock in 50 basis points less. How long would this, this this question came up when we were looking at refi on our prior debt here a year or so ago? Mm -hmm. We didn't make a very good call there, and that's not I'm not blaming anybody. But how long? It, it, we, we, and we avoided pushing the button there to get that refi in place because we thought we had time, which is understand that's where everybody's talk was. Say you get the bond election passed, mm -hmm. how long does it take you to put everything in place financially? so that we know exactly what the cost of bond and the interest rates and all that is going to be. Two things. The refunding at that time was an advanced refunding, a refunding sure. ahead of the call date. So there was a penalty to refund at that point because <coughs> you did not hit your call date. Rates increased 25 basis points. So we're still going to be in the positive to the district. No. Positive savings, yes. Yeah. Positive savings. In the week before your call date, which is what we were waiting for, the week before your call date is when interest rates shot up. So we missed it by a week. But look, I'm rerunning it right now because rates have come back down to a point where it makes it viable again, where you still have positive savings. It doesn't go away. The opportunity doesn't go away. 
we just didn't lock in uh, a potential interest penalty for, for refunding ahead of the call date. So it's still viable. So I'm rerunning your refunding as of rates. Well, what we saw on the 25th lets me know that, that, that that's good. If your bond passes in May, um, what we usually like to do is you get your certified values on July 25th. On July 25th, I know exactly what it is you will get to tax on. Right? I know what the number is that you can create taxes on, therefore how many dollars you produce based on the tax rate setting you make. Usually we wait to get those certified values before we sell bonds. If you put me in the hurry up offense and say, let's say, let's sell half of it right you now. You guys are putting us in the hurry up offense. Mm -hmm. Well, I guess what I'm saying is from the time the election would pass, if you say go today and sell bonds as quick as you can, I can do it 45 days. If we wait for your July values, then we would potentially have the bond pricing mid-August and funds would be delivered in September. So two to three months, maybe four at the most if, if we slow down just a little bit. But what I do want to have in hand before we sell all of the bonds is what are your certified values for 23, 24? That way at least I have a concrete starting point on what your INS collection is going to look like. Did you grow from last year to this year? Did you drop from last year to this year? Right? It allows me to create a, at least an estimate of what the trend is. But at that point in August of this year, if, if interest rates have decreased a substantial amount between now and then, then all of this is to the better. All I'm doing today, just like these guys are, is building you a budget that we're confident that if you follow this budget, everything that you're saying is going to happen is going to happen. If things improve between now and then, more renovation can happen, more project can happen. If yeah, interest I, like, rates I, I like that the junior high project, you got down to the point where you had multiple options at the end of it because you underrun the cost of the If interest That's rates good. are 50 points better now, then than now, then maybe we set a 19 or an 18 cent tax rate instead of a 20 or 22 cent tax rate, right? Things would be cheaper. So we're not, we're not talking ourselves out of the advantage of what might happen. We're just leaving ourselves the flexibility in case they don't. And I think what this team is saying is, and, and your board too is this board to give the team and your own community the trust level that you gave them on the junior high and with the understanding that we can potentially make that same thing happen now again your your junior high is, is an amazing facility and i'm not painting these guys into a corner but i know that that's their very intention too is give us in the community that level of trust to if we pass it make that happen and we will we will pull out all the stops and do everything we did last time to try and make that happen again I think I'm going to modify your question, John, for the board here a little bit ago when you said, um, I want to paraphrase here, sure. you know, that, that the board's decision is whether or not um, to toss this to the hands of the, of the community to make the decision. Um, I'm going to modify that a little bit because I think there, there is, as you can tell, real support from the seven of us to be able to, to provide the, the improvements that we need to provide. I think the question for the board is how do we place this question in front of the community to get the most positive response from it? So I'm first going to ask if there's any other questions for the group or for for anybody else here. My I, sec. I wanted to say something. Oh, oh, David. David. Uh, the facilities are 60 plus years old, and I want to say I've been very impressed by the maintenance team, especially on <coughs> keeping everything going as long as they have and then it is not cost effective to change everything that is just because of it and then that's where we go in and look at stuff and then uh but just what i've seen on how much equipment maintenance has been able to keep going it's i've been very impressed with that and i'm just i don't want to take any away from the, the team that's been appreciate that we know we got a good one set back there I oh, hope He's okay. <laughs> <laughs> you got to get to know him. <laughs> we do. So my next question just for the board is to determine desire to do one of two things, either call a special meeting for a week from today or add this question to the agenda for the for the 15th. So if you have a community meeting, and good, bad, I, you know, I'm kind of indifferent on it. Is that the school that does that? Is that the committee that does that? I was not anticipating a community meeting. Okay. Yeah, that's kind just of us, after just I left us, listening. Just yeah, us. yeah, no, and I, I get that. I get that. And we'll, yeah. we'll have plenty of uh, just Facebook comments and, and text messages to our phones. Yeah. I just a special meeting. Uh -huh. My 
I mean, and, and I'm one of seven. Uh, my direction would be to add it to the agenda on the 15th. So if people wanted to attend, it was easier for those that couldn't come here at noon rather than the 10th. Realizing it's two days ahead of the 17th, if we have a positive vote to be able to, to go ahead, the two days is still two days. Plenty of time, right? Can I ask one question? Dive in. The only risk is you don't have 72 hours to repost. So if there are any issues about whether you can get a quorum for that meeting on the 15th, we need to be aware of that. If you are confident that you will have at least four people here, go ahead and go with the 15th. Yeah. We're good. It's it's okay. it's it's the date that we had decided upon at our previous regular meeting. Done and it's, done. It's a weird because it's a Wednesday, yeah. which I am exceedingly it's reluctant it's to true. ever do that. But in February, you take the dates that the most people are available, and we had seven yeses, so no problem. So barring as as major disaster, I don't have any concerns. Yeah. So that's, that's that's the only thing with being that close to no, the No, we'll, we'll be good. No problem. We'll also, good. Friday. Next Friday would be very short time for us to prepare and read. This isn't our full time job. Yep. Yep. I do want to tell the committee thanks. Yes. Yes. Because Thank I know you, you guys have worked hard and appreciate y'all getting all this put together. And it's a lot. A lot of information. And we do want to thank you all for allowing us to, you know, to have a special meeting, to allowing all of us to come present that. And we do thank you all for that and appreciate that. And, and I do want to thank Joe and Greg and Steve. Guys, they've worked with this committee for a long time and have charged us this much. This is how much we have into this. And we got drawings. We got a lot of stuff. We got a lot of advice uh, lot from of John. Could, John's done a lot of work. Some three days together in 45 days, a month, 45 days. Mm -hmm. So you can publish them out there in the public. Maybe even a flyover, fly through, maybe. If you want to, I mean, I, I'd have to charge you for that, but it'd be, I don't know how to well, <laughs> so I can't do that. We did. Yeah, we did. an outside firm for the last one, too. We, we did. <laughs> and I remember, you know, that was, was the, the board's decision at that point in time that we felt it was important enough to expend district funds, and I don't remember yep. what it was. It was several thousand dollars. <laughs> was it 15? Okay. But, uh, that we, expend, we decided it was important enough because we felt it was important to do whatever we could to get the bond to pass, bond, and that was something that we felt was was good enough to be able to do. And I think this board, again, speaking for myself only, but you know, the, the, those are the types of things that, that depending on our decision. The more time I have yeah. to do that, would be great. Okay. But again, guys, we have spent no money. These guys, I trusted because they were all involved with the junior high project, which everybody in this community is really happy with. <laughs> <laughs> but they're hoping to get the job. You know what I'm saying? That's why they're doing this work, and they got a reputation, and they got something with us. So that hasn't been done. I just want to make that clear. We have not signed any agreements with anybody. We appreciate that. Thank you. Okay. One discussion or action item, um, consideration of possible action on concerning optional features for the field lighting project that was approved back on the 26th. When we approved that project, the one thing we did not talk about, and totally my fault for not thinking about it, uh, we had talked earlier about the action lighting, uh, that we did not add that as an option on that. Um, Alan does need to send in uh, the, the contract to get everything move, moving forward on this. When he and I visited earlier, I thought, well, shoot, we're going to be meeting. Let's throw one action item on here to be able to discuss. Uh, the difference in cost for the action lighting today versus if we decide to do it later is you've got to do it later up on top of the pole. Here we do it on the ground. Alan, can you describe a little bit about what it actually does? Basically, what I'm understanding is uh, the difference in cost is just the wiring for each pole. Because to have the action lighting for them to be able to. Uh, don't quote me on it. I think they can do it off their phone, iPad, whatever they hook to the Wi-Fi of the unit that's there. You know, they can make a flash, they can spotlight, they can do different scenarios with the actual field lighting. But to make that happen, they have to pre-wire the poles to each light on that pole to make it self-control whatever they designed to do. So the extra cost is just actually the extra wiring to each pole. 
<laughs> and the whole deal is if we wait till we put them up and you decide to do it later, then you're going to be paying three or four times. That. And, that, and that's the only difference between these two quotes, is that right? It's, it's actually the what would, you, what would you use that for? Okay, good you question. Touchdowns, the three days, been game. Half time. Band doing a presentation at halftime. And you just. Queen. Uh, <laughs> okay. I mean, Canyon does it when they score a touchdown. They, you've seen it on the OU games. They do, do that in yeah. KG games. Uh, I, about all of, all of them do. My question is can you turn them on and off with your phone without this? Because you're going to have to have somebody run this also. We score a touchdown and we spend $10,000 to flash the lights and nobody flash the lights. And I'm going to be looking at you guys going. They're electric touch? fireworks. Need more touchdowns. Yeah, we need right? more touchdowns. Yeah. Right? We need <laughs> lots more touchdowns. I don't care what the lights do. <laughs> but <laughs> the <laughs> question <laughs> is, do you want to do it now or don't do it at all? Make people that's what it is. Is most way. everybody putting stuff in it or are they doing it on the average? I mean, we we did uh, the football lights over at the Grimm School and they did it. And Groom. And Groom. Groom's pretty progressive in all their stuff. <laughs> <laughs> My brother in law is their board president, so he, he runs the show over there, I think. Yeah, one, more than one sport out there playing, they could do it too. The soccer field? Yep, yeah, soccer can soccer, use it too. Track beats. There's a lot of reasons. But so it's something of the future that we probably need to get on board with. It's futuristic. Yeah. It, I think we will regret not yeah. doing it later. For the just yeah, well, I'm, I'm already over my sticker shock thing here, guys. So let's just say let's just <laughs> the timing's bad. So, so three hundred thousand <laughs> lights for no. Dagger, but is that a motion? But Sounds yes, like that's a motion. Yeah. Yeah. I a second. <laughs> Bam. <laughs> Sorry, strong arming the board. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> we have a motion and a second to approve the additional option features for the field lighting project that was approved last January twenty sixth. Any additional discussion? All in favor? All opposed? Motion carries 7 0. This meeting is adjourned. Do you have hamburgers? I do. So grab you a hamburger on the way out. I kept trying to bring them in. I didn't know you had to eat.